Do we have somebody from who from the first talk? That presentation looks good as well. So we have, uh, it seems to be time to start the uh, session. Welcome you to uh, this Friday session for the advanced composite materials and <clears throat> functional materials. Um, is the first speaker uh, or representative here? Not hearing anyone or seeing anyone. Um, this is uh, from the University uh, Polytechnic. And is there, I don't think there is a video or is there a video for this one? Uh, hi, uh, there is no video for this one. Yeah, I didn't see one in the submissions. So we'll give it another minute or two. If that person doesn't show up, then uh, I guess we will wait uh, until 1040 to start the next talk. Or 1035, sorry. Okay, so for, for those joining, the, the first speaker appears to be a no-show, so we're just going to wait um, and adhere to the schedule in case people are, are coming in and out. So we'll start the second talk 
Uh, I see the speakers here at 10.35. Hello. Uh, so, may I start the presentation? Uh, we'll, we'll wait to keep to the schedule. So, uh, at okay. 35, uh, feel yeah. free to share it and, and check, though, if you want. Um, okay. Okay. Thanks. <laughs>
Okay, I'd like to welcome everybody uh, to the Functional Composite Materials. Um, as we saw, uh, for those who joined late, the, the first speaker was uh, apparently a, a no-show. Uh, these are all invited talks within the session, so everybody will have 15 minutes. Um, we're trying to strictly adhere to the time schedule. If you have any questions for the speakers, uh, it is recommended that you put them in chat because uh, there probably won't be time for, for questions and answers uh, to go on. Uh, and so the next speaker uh, in, in the session is on first principle calculations of the energy flux for bio-inspired personalized thermal comfort wearables. Uh, it's a contribution um, from Romania and, and George uh, Stubiano, I believe. Uh, are you ready to go? Yes, yes, Adam. Thank you. I'm ready to go. Okay, so you can uh, share your screen. Uh, yes, yes. Oh, sorry. Okay, I don't know if you can see. Uh, can yeah, you see? Uh, and we can hear you. Okay, perfect. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, so, uh, yeah, my name is George Tibiano, and yeah, I'll jump uh, straight into the presentation. Uh, so, uh, Humans have a mechanism of thermoregulation, which is part of a homeostatic mechanism that keeps our bodies at the optimum operating temperature. An important feature of this mechanism is that different people have different temperatures at which they feel comfortable uh, due to personal variations in metabolism and also because the basal metabolic rate is different for people from different climate zones. The stimulus for the thermoregulatory behavior uh, such as seeking shade or adjusting our clothing is our conscious sensation of thermal discomfort. As the body tries to maintain its core temperature of around 37 degrees Celsius, uh, the mechanisms of vasoconstriction and vasodilation uh, kick in to help preserve our core body temperature through sweating and shivering. Human beings exchange heat with the outside environment from multiple mechanisms, radiation, evaporation, also known as perspiration, conduction, and convection. The rate of heat exchange is determined by the metabolic energy production for each activity that we are uh, doing. The best way to control the heat exchange between uh, our body and environment is through the use of clothing. In order to deal with heat and cold, respectively, there are a large variety of clothing available. Uh, many of them have active and passive methods for thermal regulation. Uh, each of the active and passive clothing have specific advantages and disadvantages, as you can see on this slide. For making thermal comfort materials for clothing, the use of synthetic polymer materials has multiple advantages. They're available in large quantities and the production can be scaled up uh, at uh, low cost. Uh, also, there are financial and environmental benefits because when we use thermal comfort material in clothing, we can uh, ex expand the range of set point temperatures for heating and cooling inside buildings, which uh, globally could lead to something like 3% reduction in energy consumption, which is financially positive for the consumers and also has an environmental benefit. Now, in order to make new uh, thermal comfort materials, uh, it's good to develop uh, new approaches that bring together the four mechanisms of heat exchange. Radiation, which is over 50% of the heat exchange flux in a sedentary indoor setting. Uh, perspiration, which is uh, around 50% of the heat exchange during uh, heavy exercise. And also conduction and convection, which represent more than 50% of the heat exchange with the environment uh, in uh, outdoors in cold climates. 
in our approach, we use polymer-based uh, nanocomposites uh, that can also be actuated mechanically or electrically to modulate the heat flux uh, and also integrate all these four mechanisms of heat exchange. Now, as source of inspiration, we use the dynamic light reflecting uh, skin of the mirror spider, uh, also called Twitasia argentio punctata, which is an excellent source of inspiration for a new generation of adaptive uh, thermal management uh, clothing. So this spider has silvery patches with different sizes on the abdomen, look like solid pieces of mirror. Uh, but actually these uh, patches can change size depending on how the spider feels. And these reflective patches are composed of guanin, which gives the spider the color and the reflectance of uh, light. Also, humans uh, in the 1960s developed the space blanket, a well-known technology with uh, many applications in medical, sports and space uh, fields. Uh, but this uh, technology does not have the possibility to dynamically change the amount of heat reflected in uh, infrared radiation. It can be either on or off. Uh, what we are trying to develop is a next generation platform that brings together the capability uh, of the space blanket to reflect a large amount of heat in the form of infrared radiation and to combine it with the dynamic capabilities of uh, reflection uh, of the mirror spider. So for this, the procedure at laboratory scale, so we are uh, talking about technological readiness level two through four, uh, involves, uh, this procedure involves doctor blading, low emissivity polymer films on a substrate, followed by a nanometer thick uh, metal oxide layer deposition, followed by doctor blading another uh, polymer film with high emissivity, uh, followed by the uh, lamination of a support fabric, uh, thermal ager, aging depending on the polymer that we use, and then delamination from the substrate, which results in patches of functional material. This is a two uh, side material, one side is active for cooling the skin by removing heat through uh, infrared radiation emission towards the environment. The other side can be used uh, to heat the skin by emitting infrared uh, radiation towards the skin. Uh, I can mention that after consulting with experts from clothing industry, we are also now researching on uh, the options for replacing the metal oxide layer with a new polymer based layer for easier future scal scalability in a roll to roll process. We characterize the properties of such materials by mechanical, spectroscopical, thermal, gravimetric, electrical, and morphological uh, methods. The mechanism for modulation of the radioactive heat flux is based on differences in emissivity of each of the uh, two sides of the nanocomposite materials, and also the possibility for mechanical or electrical actuation of the nanocomposite by linear uh, stretching. Uh, basically, uh, in the initial unactuated state, the nanocomposite film reflects most of the uh, infrared incoming radiation, similar to uh, the space blanket. Uh, so when subjected to actuation, uh, there is an uh, increased amount of uh, infrared radiation passing through the material. Uh, also, we did tests on uh, human beings, the members of the research team, uh, basically uh, on the forearm with uh, these patches of uh, material and with uh, sensors for temperature, for the temperature on the two sides of the material on the skin, uh, sensors for air temperature and humidity, and an infrared camera. And the uh, images uh, recorded with infrared camera show that uh, when the uh, forearm is covered with uh, this uh, material in an unactuated state, the temperature is close to that of the environment 
and when we uh, uh, linearly uh, stretch the material, the temperature recorded gets close to that of the skin. For developing a thermal model for this material, there are multiple initial hypotheses, such as the body is in a sedentary state, such as like in uh, indoor, in an office, uh, the air gap uh, between the skin and the material and uh, is much smaller compared with the size of the human body. Uh, the uh, material covers 100% of the skin and uh, uh, the air circulation uh, through the material and between the uh, clothing made of the material and the skin surface is negligible. Um, also, um, the, uh, the two sides of the uh, material uh, act in different ways, having different emissivity. And uh, so one side can keep the skin surface comfortably cool when the environmental temperature is uh, pretty hot. And the other side could keep the skin surface comfortably warm when the environmental temperature is too cold. And for each side, we can draw the uh, heat flows that affect both the nanocomposite material and the skin. So we can write the equations for this each heat flows for each side of the nanocomposite material. Uh, so we have like equation one, the heat transfer from the skin via radiation, equations two and 12, heat transfer through the air gap via conduction, uh, equations three and 13, heat transfer to the environment via convection, equations four and 14, heat transfer from the outer side of the co uh, composite material, uh, also, the heat transfer to the skin uh, from the material and the uh, environment. So we have equations for the heat reflectant from the inner side of the composite material to the skin, the heat transfer from the environment to the skin via radiation, the heat transfer from the inner side of the composite material to the skin via radiation, and the emittance of the inner side of the material. Also, overall, for the uh, energy balance, we have equations for both for cooling and heating uh, cases. We have the total heat transfer from the skin, the energy balance for the skin, and the energy balance for the composite uh, material. So, Using these equations, together with the experimental data recorded with the sensors and infrared camera on the test subjects uh, for, uh, for the temperature on the inner and outer side of the material and the air temperature, um, we can basically uh, make the calculations and choose polymers mater polymer materials with uh, desired properties in terms of infrared transmittance and uh, reflectance. And we can also change uh, from the design of the clothing, uh, the sleeve, uh, the air gap between the skin and the material so that either the cooling or the heating cap capability of this material, uh, depending on the setup uh, we choose to balance the uh, total heat generation or the heat loss from the skin to the outside environment. So from these uh, equations, we find the uh, maximum ambient temperature for the cooling uh, setup or the minimum ambient temperature for the heating setup, which can be sustained without compromising personal thermal comfort. So for the cooling setup, the measurements show the maximum temperature uh, at which the cooling capability of the material balances the heat generation uh, rate. Uh, it goes from around uh, 31 degrees Celsius for the initial unstretched material to around uh, 29.5 degrees Celsius for the material stretched with uh, 20%. For the heating setup, the um, 
minimum temperature at which the heating capability of the composite material balances the heat loss rate varies from around 12 degrees Celsius for the initial unstretched material to about uh, 10.5 degrees Celsius for the material stretched with 20%. Uh, Future work will focus on optimizing the design for this polymer nanocomposite, as I mentioned, replacing the uh, nanometer thick oxide, metal oxide layer with a new uh, polymer and further developments of the thermal model, basically involving collecting data for uh, a larger pool of test subjects, given the significant variability from one individual to the other. That's all, thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Thank you for uh, the talk. Once again, if there are questions, it's probably best to put them in the chat. Uh, is uh, the second or the, the next speaker here, a high performance silk-based bioplastics from Regenerative Fibroin? Not seeing the speaker. I think we have uh, a uh, submission, a video submission that we can play. Yes, we have. Just wait me a minute. pleasure for me to have the opportunity to give this talk and I thank the organizer for inviting me and you all for listening. I will introduce you on a topic related to the specificity of a natural origin material with peculiar characteristics. Always fascinating human being in a millennia, silk. In this presentation I will tell you about a research mainly done by Dr. Alessio Pucciarelli during his doctorate activity supervised by me, with the help of professors Antonella Motta and Alberto Guaranta from the University of Trento and Vamsi Yelvalli from the Virginia Commonwealth University, and from the biological experiments adjuvated by Dr. Silvia Chiera, she also from the University of Trento. Silk fibrine is the major component of silk. It is a structural protein responsible for the excellent mechanical properties of the silk filament. Going beyond the uses for textiles, silk fibroin is generally isolated from the silk wire, dismantling the overall supramolecular and intramolecular structure until unfolding the protein and solubilizing it into a solvent, usually water. This permits its use as a raw material for building up structures that find use in different fields, from tissue engineering to drug delivery, which makes silk fibroin one of the most interesting biomaterials in the current scenario. Silk fibroin can be recast into different shapes, like films, hydrogels, foams, micro and nanofibers or tubes, characterized by large tunable properties excellent biocompatibility and biodegradability, versatile functionalization and, generally, optimal interaction with living tissue. Among the derivable materials, the possibility of building large monoliths was still missing. Some attempts have been done in recent time from Marello et al., starting from the idea of solution casting that allowed obtaining large monoliths the two main limits of this technique were the large shape deformation due to the shrinkage, 
caused by the water evaporation and the excessively long process time, since the complete evaporation can last from several days to several weeks, depending on the dimension of the monoliths. Missing in this scenario was an alternative method for fast fabricating steel fibrine monoliths, starting from dry fibrine without using of harsh chemicals and high temperatures. This because a possible translation to an industrial process should imply objects production in minutes, the removal of potential toxic chemicals, increasing the overall ecological impact, and finally, the use of low temperatures that permit the embedding of thermosensitive bioactive molecules such as enzymes or drugs. A low temperature called sintering of silk fibrine, which is the procedure I'm going to describe, has been reported in a paper available on advanced functional materials. As first attempt, we started from the dry fibrine obtained by lyophilizing the protein solution and just tried to simply compress it into a metal mold hoping that a sufficient pressure could trigger the sinterization. Unlucky, the procedure, unless coadjuvated by high temperatures, higher than 120 degrees Celsius, permitted us to obtain just a compressed powder instead of a sintered structure. We decided then to modify our approach and try using water as a plasticizer. We introduced a further step in the process constituted of the hydration of the dry silk flakes for a short period in a closed humidity saturated chamber. Only by hydrating the silk powder with water for a few minutes, the material could be easily sintered, turning from a wide compressed power to a continuous semi transparent chip. The process was studied setting up a design of experiment using two observable physical properties as indicator of the material transformation. The change in the optical transparency measured as the optical transmittance in the 400-800 nanometer range and the change in the mechanical properties measured as the increase of the young compression modulus. Factors studied in the model were the maximum pressure applied to the mold, the run time, that is the time to reach the maximum applied pressure, the time the mold is kept under pressure, and the percentage of the water added. These four factors have been then combined to build up an equation containing the weighted contribution of the proportional terms and all the combination of the mixed terms then evaluated against the experimental values of light absorbance and elastic modulus. Analyzing the absorbance values against addition of water and maintaining time, it resulted clear that the dry material was incapable of granting low absorbance levels. Among the samples exposed to water instead, those showing higher transparency were the ones maintained under pressure for longer time Given these conditions, the shortest ramp time, 120 seconds, and highest pressure applied, 400 MPa, resulted in the most transparent samples in which all the fibrin flakes were sintered in a continuous thermoplastic material. Similar results were obtained analyzing the values of the young modulus calculated from the compression curves and which was expected to be maximized in the case of complete sintering. These conditions could be obtained with a low ramp time, a high pressure, low maintenance time, and with the presence of added water, corresponding to the maximum young model's values of about 1100 megapascal in dry condition. To try, and describe the physical mechanism at the base of the transition. We have evaluated the protein secondary structures forming during the process, analyzed through infrared analysis and picked the convolution of the amide-1 region. 
We decided to compare the transition after sintering of dry flakes and hydrated flakes for short 30 minutes and long time 12 hours. We analyzed just after lyophilization. When analyzed just after lyophilization, the flakes appeared having very low crystallinity levels with very low levels of antiparallel and stable beta sheets, which rise from about 5 to 9% when exposed to water vapor for 30 minutes. When exposed for 12 hours instead, beta sheet content rise to almost 36%, and the overall stable beta contributions, parallel and antiparallel, to almost 45%. After sintering, the sample exposed for 30 minutes to water could maintain the contribution of stable beta sheet low, while sample sintered after 12 hours moistening didn't change significantly the overall crystalline structure and resulted completely not sintered. This analysis permitted to confirm that a low initial crystallinity is crucial for the process to occur at low temperature and that the presence of water is capable of plasticizing fibrin, permitting the thermal reflow. However, since water is responsible of triggering the transition to beta structures, the sintering has to be performed before the transition occurring, and possibly with fast run time, as previously evidenced by transparency. The effect of the optimized compression process was also observed by SEM micrographs at different time points. Just after the pre-compression, at 40 seconds and 80 seconds, and at the end of the process, 120 seconds. The black arrows indicate the direction of the compression detectable from the stratified structure formed during the process. In particular, the pressure planes are perpendicular to the compression direction, with flow lines visible and evidencing low temperature reflow occurring. These structures can be clearly recognized in the pre-compressed material and in the first time point at low magnification. At higher magnification, column 2, we can observe the viscous flow occurring, the formation of ripples at 40 seconds and their flow 80 seconds, forming compact material 120 seconds. The flow is visible also at a higher magnification where the material seems to be in sort of a melted state. After 120 seconds the material results to be compact with typical microstructure of a brittle fracture. The biological response of the fibrin material resulting from the sintering was finally compared to the behavior of similar geometry samples prepared by mold casting of polycaprolactin, an FDA approved degradable material largely proposed for bone tissue engineering applications. Samples were evaluated using confocal microscopy, capturing images of adhered adipose derived mesenchymal stem cells at different time points on both types of samples at three different magnification evidencing cell cytoskeletal morphology, green, and nuclei, blue staining. From confocal images, we could observe a general and homogeneous cell distribution on both surface samples along time points. However, at day 5 it is possible to observe that, even though the PCL surface samples present higher cell density, the cell shape resulted elongated indicated that cell-to-cell -cell interactions are more focused among cells than cell-to-sample surface. On the other hand, on low temperature sintered fibrin samples, cell shape is more extended, indicated that the interaction between cells and sample surface is higher, promoting a greater degree of spreading. This behavior can indicate that since low temperature sintered fibrin samples are made of protein, their surfaces offer more additional sites to cells, improving the mechanism of interaction between cells and surface. This holds great potential in the design of a microscale scaffold 
for various dish engineering applications. As conclusion, I hope to have demonstrated you the possibility of optimizing a fast low temperature method to obtain large monolith of solid fibering reporting for the first time a thermal reflow at 40 degrees for lyophilized silk fibering. We could evidence the key role of the absorbed water vapor during the compression phase and the fact that it is in competition with the self-reorganization of silk fibering secondary structure. We strongly believe that large-scale solid fibering objects produced with this method can find application in implantable bioresorbable devices, particularly when one issue still present in the obtained material will be resolved. I'm referring to the drastic reduction of the young modulus observed when the sintered material is exposed to simulated physiological fluids. Young modulus values, in this case, dropped from a maximum of 1100 MPa when dry to a low 200 MPa in physiological conditions and caused by water absorbed and acting as plasticizer inside the material. This fact could strongly limit some application in bone tissue engineering, especially when load bearing is required. For this reason, we are currently focusing on an escape strategy consisting in the use of a low toxicity crosslinker, water and temperature activated, capable of enhancing mechanical properties while preserving cell viability. The first results of this work are at the moment submitted for review and will be possibly available soon to the scientific community. One last slide to acknowledge my co-workers, Dr. Alessio Bucciarelli, main experimental executor and together with me, inventor and designer of the process, Professors Alberto Quaranta, Vanzia da Valli and Antonella Motta, supervisors of the physical and biological experiments, and Silvia Chiera, executor of these lasts. I leave you showing the evidence of the processability of the sintered silk fibering monoliths here shaped as gears using a simple commercial laser cutting machine. This picture reports light yellow samples made of raw fibering together with black samples that are instead both sintered and cross-linked fibering. Thank you for your attention. So the next uh, speaker is, I believe, here, Professor Hammer, uh, discussing lifetime improvement of anti-corrosive hybrid coatings by the addition of lithium and cerium self-healing agents. Uh, he's requesting that the uh, video be played. So can we start that? And as sure. that's going, once again, uh, please feel free to add questions in the chat and he can answer those. My name is Peter. Today I will present our recent work in which we tried to clarify the role of the oxidation state of cerium for the self-healing ability of organic inorganic coatings. Now the work was in, is entitled Lifetime Improvement of Anti-Corrosive PMMA Silica Coatings Using Serum-3 and Serum-4 Self-Healing Agents. The work was performed at the uh, Institute of Chemistry of the Sao Paulo State University in Brazil. Now, the organic and inorganic hybrid coatings combine properties of the polymeric phase such as processability, transparency and hydrophobicity with the high mechanical, thermal and chemical stability of ceramic materials such as silica which also provide excellent adhesion to metallic substrates. This is possible by adding a certain amount of a coupling molecule 
that links covalently both phases. In this way, contracting the structure, creating a dense network and provide covalent bonding to the metallic substrate. This material can be applied as very efficient anti-corrosive barrier to protect metallic components such as alum aluminum 7075 alloy using used preferentially in the aircraft structures. To ensure a long-term protection really for, uh, for this coating system, two conditions has to be fulfilled to provide an effective physical barrier against aggressive agents with an active protection by the seal feeling ability. Now our results show that only 4 micrometer thick PMMA silica coating provides effective corrosion protection for more than 720 days in contact with standard saline solution. For this active protection Serum salts show very promising results. In this work, we present new insights on the cell filling mechanism of especially serum 4 in the corrosion and mechanical induced effects. So for this purpose, different concentrations of serum 3 and serum 4 salts were added separately to the inorganic solution containing tetraetoxicillin in an acidified ethanol water solution, which was then mixed with the organic solution of methyl metacrylate and MPTS coupling agents containing a siloxane group attached to a metacrylate tail, thus providing covalent bonding between both phases. The homogeneous sol was then used to deposit PMS silica coating by immersion on the alum aluminum 7075 alloy. The samples were then dried films, but also freestanding samples at 60 degrees C during 24 hours and then cured at 160 degrees C for three hours. Follow me now this procedure Two sets of samples were obtained containing between 500 and 5000 ppm of both serum precursors. They were labeled as serum 305 to serum 35 and then serum 405 and serum 45, including the PMMA reference uh, referred to as serum zero. Now to the results, the coating are transparent, they are tend to be a bit yellowish with increasing serum content, present an excellent adhesion on aluminum substrates of up to 22 megapascal and at medium serum contents the thermal stability reached a value of up to 250 degree C. Now the atomic force microscopy and secondary electron microscopy showed that the surface of the coatings is very homogeneous and smooth with RMS roughness increasing with higher C4 content uh, from 0 0.3 to 6.7 nanometers indicating in this case of cerium for the formation of larger cerium nanoparticles in the PMMA matrix. The absence of pores and cracks confirms the uniformity of the coating. This is an essential precondition for elevated corrosion properties. Okay, then the coatings were subjected to electromechanical impedance spectroscopy in continuous immersion tests. All coatings showed high uh, corrosion resistance with a low frequency impedance modulus of up to 24 giga ohms, six orders of magnitude higher than the uncoated aluminum. In terms of durability, the incorporation of serum-3 showed excellent protection providing a passive barrier of more than 600 days obtained for the serum-3-1 uh, coating. Coatings with intermediate serum-4 concentrations also provided excellent 
adhesion and corrosion protection with an impedance modulus higher than 4 gigaohm after more than seven and 720 days uh, of immersion observed for the cerium 4 one coatings. This performance is related to the homogeneous cross-linked hybrid structure and the strong adhesion to the aluminum substrate. Although both coatings provided long-term protection, the self-healing ability as a key feature was observed only for the cerium-4 coatings. This can be seen here. The cerium-4-05 coating showed an impedance recovery after pitting. Here we can observe the main changes in the IES profile before and after failure. After three hour of immersion, a quasi-ideal capacitive behavior is observed over the almost whole entire uh, frequency range followed by a drop after 21 days due to local failure. However, after 42 days, a self-healing effect occurs, recovering the impedance modulus by one order of magnitude. This phase angle shows that the main recovery occurs here in the low frequency range, suppressing the charge transfer at the passive layer of the coating aluminum interface. Now, a similar effect was observed for the cerium 4 5 coatings. After the appearance of a pit for 157 days of exposure, the impedance modulus was spontaneously restored by one order of magnitude after 16 days. In this case, the phase angle recovery and the high frequency range indicates the filling of the defects, thus recovering the corrosion resistance of the coating. The more, more insight on the regeneration process was performed by Toff Sims surface analysis. The overlay maps of aluminum, cerium oxide, and PMMA and the ionic fragments reveal the formation of cerium oxide within the pits. This is the red, red zones here. Né? At this point, marked in red, in the pits that block the progress of the corrosion. Interestingly, there is a spatial correlation between copper of the intermetallics of the aluminum 7075 constituent and cerium oxide fragments, indicating that the formation of cerium oxide is favored by copper intermetallic phase that contribute to the cathodic protection in the defective zone. More rigorous tests on the self-healing ability were conducted by the soul spray tests during seven days of artificial scratched coatings. Now the EIS plots were recorded after one and seven days of tests and the results show that the reference coating presented a drop of the impedance modulus due to the corrosion reactions on the surface. The cerium free samples presented a similar impedance response after one week of testing, showing, however, no inhibition effect with increasing concentration. On the other hand, cerium 4 containing coatings, a self healing effect can be clearly observed, demonstrating here the inhibitory effect of serum 4 in large defect areas. Now to study the re regeneration mechanism, SEM images and elemental EDS maps of the scratched coatings were obtained. Compared with the reference sample, the SEM images show that uh, cerium containing coatings form a film in the scratch track. 
EDS maps show that the central region of the scratch track is mainly composed of aluminum corrosion products. Although cerium was not detected in the central region of the scratch due to the low high sample depth of EDS, a clear spatial uh, correlation between cerium and copper rich zones in the scratch track and stretch scratch track edges can be observed more evident here for the cerium for five point. Now a clear evidence for the presence of cerium oxide in the scratch track was obtained by Tofsim surface maps. After seven days of salt spray test an accumulation of cerium oxide and copper species were found within the scratch track, confirming the high reactivity of serum species at intermetallic particles from forming a protective layer of insoluble species. Okay, now we take a look at the nanostructure of PML silica samples with increasing serum 4 addition, investigated by TN. In the upper images we can see for zero or low serum 4 loading, a homogeneous distribution of silica and cerium within the PMA matrix. However, larger agglomerates in the range of 30 to 80 nanometers appear for higher serum content, indicating the serum nanoparticles and probably also residual nitrites can act as nanocontainers for the liberation of serum ions at corrosion sites. Now, the oxidation state of the serum and presence of oxides were studied using the X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy. By deconvoluting the oxygen 1S and the serum 3D spectrum, the XPS results show that the self-healing ability of serum 4 containing coatings in pits and artificial defects can be related with the higher quantity of serum 4 species. In this process, leached serum 4 ions react at the bottom of the pits at low pH of these anodic sites with the EH ions produced in the oxygen reduction re reaction leading to the formation of insoluble oxides and hydroxides preferentially formed at intermetallics that act as sites for cathodic protection. Now, in summary, the structural and electrochemical investigation performed in this work showed that PMA silica serum 4 coatings with a thickness of only 5 micrometers have a very strong adhesion to the aluminum substrate and provide excellent and durable corrosion protection. This physical barrier is not only efficient then more than 720 days of immersion in standard saline solution, but also smart, providing active corrosion protection by self-healing of pits and larger artificial defects exposed to aggressive environments. So, i like to thank for your attention and I open for any questions. So please, once again, um, we thank the, the talk uh, for that interesting contribution and sorry for the interference. Um, if you have any questions, uh, please put them into the chat uh, and we will uh, move on to the next speaker is uh, Professor Xiaoping Pei. And he'll be talking about making stretchy dielectric conductive and semiconductor polymers. All right, so can you see my screen? Yes, it looks good. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. And it's my pleasure to introduce uh, uh, the work at our soft materials research lab 
uh, are making uh, stretchable electronic materials and devices. So I love to use this simple illustration to show where these materials are used. So, so basically we're dealing with thin film devices that have a pair of electrodes sandwiching a spacer, which is either dielectric or semiconductor. So for this structure to be intrinsically stretchable, we need all the materials used here to be stretchable. So we need a stretchable conductor, we need a, a stretchable dielectric and semiconductors. So in the case of uh, optoelectronic devices, we also need the uh, conductor, the electrode to be transparent. So a lot of the time, these same film structures are placed on a rubbery substrate. So which means that uh, the material, this electronic material do not need to be elastic. Okay, as long as they retain their electronic properties at the larger strength deformations, then they are fine. So I will go through some of the materials that we have been developing, starting with the uh, dielectric elastomers, which uh, is probably the easiest to deal with. So most of the synthetic rubbers are dielectric. Okay, so with a pair of compliant electrodes, and uh, which can be uh, carbon grease or carbon nanotube, you apply a high voltage to this electrode and the electrostatic force will, um, will squeeze the film in thickness and because the elastomer is incompressible, so they, they will expand in area. Uh, then let me show this video here. Uh, okay, so what do you see in this video? Lower left is uh, the carbon grease electrode, which defines the active area and we have the polymer, which is transparent um, in between. So as the voltage is applied and the expanding area and the voltage removed, it's, uh, it contracts. So this polymer is very elastic. You can see the actuation at about 100% area increase up to 100 hertz um, uh, frequency. So with this kind of larger actuated deformation, you can design a number of different devices or applications let me show a couple of examples. One of these is uh, here we have this uh, uh, polymer film wrapped around a, a compression spring in the center and the electrodes are patterned on the four separate circumferential spans. So if you activate this span, the, the, the spring rule will bend to the opposite direction. So you will see from the video here, that this kind of called spring rule, you can, you can successfully drive the different spans to create this uh, uh, deep, uh, bending in different directions. And when you wrap up the frequency, and this rule looks like it's uh, spinning its head. You can also use this uh, bending uh, rules to make a small like working robot like this one shown here. Okay, so more recently we designed this uh, uh, actuator. So it's basically the actuator is like a sheath wrapping around a silicon elastomer tubing. So we can use this actuator here to control the fluid flow in the silicon tubing. So going further beyond the dielectric elastomer concept, so we synthesize a new polymer, which we call bistable electroactive polymer or BSAP. So the BSAP is a cross-linked polymer with the majority component to be this kind of, you know, accurate compound with a long alkyl chain. So this is long alkyl chains in the polymer crystallize at the room temperature. So this polymer at room temperature is stiff. When you raise the temperature above the melting point of this nano crystallites, and the polymer becomes very soft. Okay, so basically the, to use this polymer, so it's a, uh, you know, the polymer room temperature is stiff. Uh, you raise the temperature to above the melting point and at which point you can actuate like the dielectric elastomer. Okay, create larger deformation. Then you can cool down the temperature to ambient to sort of freeze the deformation. Okay, so to return to the original shape, you just heat it up above the melting point. So this BSAP polymer allows you to actuate between different 
rigid shapes. All right, so this chart shows that uh, the ones, I mean, this part of the PCAB is basically the shape memory polymer. It's different from the conventional shape memory polymer is that the modulus change, as you see here, is that it's by a factor of two or uh, two orders of or three orders of magnitude in the very narrow temperature range. It is a very nice shape memory property. Okay, so, and to further expand the variation of the modulus, so we synthesize this composite of BCEP with the bacterial cellulose nanofibers. And these nanofibers are hydrophilic. So, so we designed this process here to allow the uniform uh, blending of these two different materials to form the composite. So this is a composite sheet and this uh, composite at room temperature, it's a, a, a stiff, uh, it's uh, with a modulus on the order of one gigapascal. When you expose it to water, the, uh, the nanofiber softens. So the composite module drops by one order magnitude. Uh, you alternatively, if you raise the temperature in a dry environment and uh, the BCEP phase softens, so also module drops by one order magnitude. At the elevated temperature and wet environment, both phases are soft. The modulus drops to the order of 40 kilopascal. So we we'll see here that this material has this reversible modulus variation between one gigapascal and 40 kilopascal, but well, four orders of, uh, of magnitude uh, change in modulus. Okay, so now I switch to uh, talk about the, um, uh, com the conductive materials that can be stretchable. And the carbon nanotube is a good stuff. So you can spray coat to form a thin layer that's stretchable. And this one shows here the carbon nanotube drives the dielectric elastomer to larger strengths and it's reversible. Okay. And uh, uh, the problem is this is that uh, the resistance of this carbon nanotube electrode increases by tens or hundreds of times at this larger strength. So, to reduce the resistance change in the deformation, so we design this process here. And there's two consequences. One is that the carbon nanotube is shaped in this serpentine shape, and also that the carbon nanotube coating conforms in the surface layer of the wrinkled surface. So this way, when you stretch the substrate, carbon nanotube layer is sort of changes from wrinkled buffer surface to flat surface. The resistance change is very small. Like this one showing here that up to about 190% area expansion, okay, the carbon nanotube electrode resistance change is, uh, is negligible. All right, so um, we also designed this process to, um, to form transparent composite electrodes that are stretchable. Okay, so, so the process in general is uh, first form a conductive coating of the uh, carbon nanotube or silver nanowise on the glass substrate, then apply the acrylic monomer, which is a liquid, and then cure form the polyacrylate, and we separate the polymer film from the substrate, and the, the percolation network now is embedded in the surface of the polymer. So this approach you know, produces a composite electrode that has several nice um, uh, uh, benefits. One is that the surface conductivity in the composite surface is the same as the original percolation network. And it's quite transparent when you use silver nanowires and, uh, and the roughness of the surface is very small. So these are required for building thin film electronic devices. And the mechanical properties of this structure is entirely determined by the polymer substrate. So this way you can introduce self-healing. Like here we use this self-healable polymer as the substrate material to form the composite electrode. And this electrode is, uh, um, uh, uh, is uh, uh, healable, okay? So shown here is that if you cut across the surface, 
and it becomes non-conductive. And by heating at 80 degrees C, you, uh, you mend the crack on the conductive electrode. Okay, so next about semiconductive materials, it's uh, harder to make a semiconductive uh, uh, materials stretchable. Okay, so I show a few examples that we have attempted. One is to use this uh, super yellow polymer. This is a, a soluble conjugate polymer for OLED devices. The polymer is a, a plastic. You stretch the polymer film, so you, you see the plastic deformation, irreversible. And so in this uh, uh, polymer blend structure, where this is this polymer. Uh, super yellow is mixed with a solid electrolyte materials. Okay, and the solid electrolyte material is hydrophilic, and it's soft. Okay, so in the uh, in the uh, blend, and the soft phase forms this dispersed uh, um, uh, phase. Okay, so this the entire structure can be stretched uh, stretched without stretching the super yellow polymer. So this way that the, this, uh, this film can be reversibly stretched. Okay, so we build a device and this uh, OLED device is different from conventional OLEDs. And so without going into the details, let me show that this uh, OLED, okay, like looks like uh, a plastic film, very soft at room temperature. And you can, you can stretch, bend and, and, and twist this, uh, this uh, uh, OLED device. Okay, so, and uh, for solar cell uh, materials, so like a PTP7 and a PCBM uh, blend, so this commonly used for polymer solar cells, and both materials are stiff. Okay, to make a blend that's stretchable, so adding the diode octane into it, so the blend film forms this nano gram uh, microstructure. Okay, so this microgram blend structure is stretchable, uh, similar as you know beach sand. Okay, so, so the sand grains are stiff, but uh, it's soft to walk on the beach. All right, so I think my time's up. So a quick summary. So just to show that the kind of efforts we are uh, exerting in making stretchable dielectric materials, semiconductors, conductors, and uh, demonstrating intrinsically stretchable devices. And so I want to end with thank, uh, thanking all the members from the Soft Materials Research Lab in the past and the present who should take all the credit for the work I shown you here? Thank you very much. Thank you for the uh, contribution and some very interesting work on the, on the flexible polymers. Uh, this is uh, once again used to chat uh, for any questions for Professor Pei. And we will move on. Uh, the next talk is by Carl Del Bay. Uh, on microstructure evolution of silicon carbide reinforced peak under tribological solicitations. Okay, thank you. Uh, I will share my screen. All right. So, hi, and uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank the organizing committee for this invited uh, presentation. This study is about the microstructural evolution of silicon carbide reinforced peak uh, with uh, under tribological solicitation. Um, I am Carl Delbe and I am a lecturer in ENI de Tarbes and I, I am a researcher also uh, and interest in tribology. This work is a joint venture between uh, three laboratories from the Southwest of France the Laboratory Génie de Production in Tarbes, the Institut Clément Adair in Albi, and the CIRIMAT in Toulouse. Uh, this presentation is a part of the Marie Dumain PhD study on tribological behavior of polymer composites. So the tribology is a science that study wear, friction, and lubrication. And in Tarbes, we consider a methodology uh, that is based on three concepts, the tribological triplet, 
the accommodation mechanism and the topological circuit. Uh, a dynamic contact between two mechanical parts is a multi-scale and a multi-physic problem that involve the mechanical device, the so two parts in contact and the interfacial elements that appear during friction between the two first body. We call it the third body. The friction is a place where occur a massive energy dissipation. Uh, so the second concept allowed us to understand where and how the energy is dissipated. The tribological circuit give us a way to know how the matter flow in the interface and how where occur. Uh, in our lab, we try to control the tribal system and in our way, we try to design new material like composite to control this tribal system. Uh, so to improve the tribal system, we study composite material with high performance application, for example, for medical or aeronautic purposes. A composite is made with two immiscible components. We choose to study PIC as a matrix. This is a thermoplastic polymer and a filler to reinforce it. Sometimes a filler is a lamellar compound like graphite or boron nitride. And we also work with granular materials. We try to understand how the filler can improve the tribological properties. That is not an intrinsic, an intrinsic property of the material, but a property of the tribal system. We hope to reduce wear and degradation of the composite part that will enhance the economic and environmental impact of our mechanical devices. In this presentation, we are interested in the evolution of the microstructure of the polymer and its composites with the tubological solicitation. We study different techniques to measure the crystallinity of the peak and choose one to characterize it at the scale of the rear track, the Raman spectroscopy. We found significant indicators to study the crystallinity at the surface of our sample and at micro scale. Uh, PIC is a semi-crystalline thermoplastic polymer. It is a high performance material. On this photo here, uh, we can see the amorphous part in black and the crystalline part in white, thanks to a polarized microscope. We show the filler that is silicon carbide. This is a great ceramics that is also known for its great mechanical performances. By using it as a filler, we want to strengthen the volume properties and reduce the plastic deformation. The crystallinity rate can be measured by well-known different techniques, density measurement, XRD analysis, or DSC. All the techniques are volume characterization. But to have access to the crystallinity on the wear track, we need a more local an analysis. This is why we are interested in Raman spectroscopy and we search to improve the um, existing indicators that we can find in the literature and try to discover new ones. We proposed in a recent publication, a Raman indicator of the crystallinity that take in consideration the CO mode here at 1,644 and 1,651 cm here. In these two spectra, we can see the difference in intensity of these two modes as a function of the crystallinity rate for two controlled peak samples. Here, here is a amorphous peak and the mode here at uh, the first mode is low and the second mode, the amorphous one, is high. For the crystalline peak, the first mode is high and the second one is low. So we use this formula to um, calculate an indicator that is in very good correlation with crystallinity measured with density method. Our tribological tests are done on a unique device, a tribolab from Brooker, and the experimental conditions are shown in this table. Uh, we use a steel ball 
on a flat sample of peak or composite, the normal load is 25 Newton. The frequency of the oscillation are five Hertz. The motion is a reciprocal translation. And the stroke, the stroke length is 10 millimeters. The duration of the test are 300, 600, 900, 1,200, 1,500 seconds. The environment is the ambient air and there is no lubrication. This is a dry friction. In the sample were made with PIC, the wear track is analyzed with hundreds of spectra. We saw that the crystallinity is a function of the location of the track. Uh, we see that at the edge of the track, the crystallinity is low and at the middle of the track, the crystallinity is decreased more and more. We also uh, made different spectra at different value of the duration test. And we see that the crystallinity decrease with the increase of the duration of the test. So the crystallinity is pressure dependent and time dependent. For peak filled with silicon carbide, the crystallinity is also dependent of the location in uh, and the time is also time dependent. We measure, we measure the same qualitative evolution like in peak, low uh, decrease of crystallinity at the edge and high decrease of the crystallinity in the middle of the track. We also the same time dependence evolution, but we are not for the moment able to compare this result with the reference material with peak. This is a semi qualitative, a semi quantitative characterization. We also observe Shalamak waves in the track. The Shalamak waves are formed with plastic deformation on the surface. With the spectra that we measure on the surface with the map, we see that uh, there is an evolution of the crystallinity that is dependent with the plastic deformation. So we link the deformation with the evolution of the crystallinity. So our study, we, in our study, we see that there is the presence of the third body in the form of a stable tribofilm. We also measure the decrease of the crystallinity and see that it is pressure dependent. This decrease of crystallinity is also time dependent. And we uh, are able to make all these measurements by developing a Raman indicator for the crystallinity evolution. We also compare this uh, indicator for peak and composites. And we are now able to make a semi-quantitative characterization and we hope for the future to make a more quantitative characterization. Uh, I thank you for uh, your attention and I'm open for questions. Thank you for the presentation and um, being uh, actually short of time. So, we have time for a question if there is one. Or if not, uh, you can always uh, contact him on in terms of the uh, chat or uh, via his email. I think we can continue on. Thank you again for the presentation. Uh, you, our next you. contribution is from AIST, um, Rajashri uh, Sundaram. Thank you. I'll uh, try to share my presentation now. Am I on? Uh, am I audible? Uh, yes, it, it just uh, had a little bit of a fluctuation there. Right. Okay. Uh Okay, uh, let's try to kind of get through this. Um, is my presentation visible? Uh, yes, it is. It's not in slideshow mode though. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll put it in presentation mode. There, it, it looks good. Awesome. Okay. Um, well, it's, uh, it's probably four o'clock in Japan, so let's uh, try to power this through. Um, 
Thank you for this opportunity to present our work. Uh, my name is Raj Sundaram. I'm a staff research scientist uh, from the CNT Application Research Center, AIST Japan. Uh, AIST is a national institute of uh, advanced into industrial science and technology. It's a government national laboratory based in Tsukuba, Japan. And uh, as an institution, we try to bridge industrial and academic research. And uh, in the CNT Application Research Center, we specialize on uh, carbon nanotube uh, synthesis, characterization, and application development. And I belong to the application development team uh, focusing on metal carbon nanotube composites. And in this talk, I'll present our work on uh, developing uh, lightweight, homogeneously mixed heat and current stable copper carbon nanotube composite electric conductors. Uh, first, a little bit of background, as you all know, um, the excellent uh, electrical and thermal properties of copper makes it really indispensable in all our electrical and electronic systems. Uh, however, there are issues uh, in electronic devices, copper interconnects fail due to electromigration and delamination arising from copper silicon CTE mismatch. Um, copper wires, because of the high density, add a lot of weight to our cars and planes, which is detrimental to fuel efficiencies and uh, the CO, CO2 emission cuts. And uh, our solution to the challenges posed by copper is to add lightweight CNTs with high electromigration resistance and a low thermal expansion. Um, I worked on composites for quite some time, and previously we made uh, composites as uh, planar micro patterns and macroscopic sheets uh, with a high volume percent of nanotubes homogeneously mixed with copper. But we encountered two issues. The first is how to make homogeneous composites as wires, uh, which is a practically applicable structure. And uh, second is how to control the microstructure and clarify structure versus property correlation. And these are the issues that I've been focusing on. And uh, addressing the first issue, um, uh, we developed uh, wire composites with uh, copper uniformly mixed with a uh, high volume percent of carbon nanotubes. Um, we could see homogeneous mixing uh, along the wire length and with around 45 volume percent of CNTs, the wire densities were around five gram per cc, which is uh, two thirds that of uh, copper. Now that's a significant density reduction. And how did we make these composites? Uh, uh, we made these composites by a two-step electrodeposition uh, method, and we started with CNT wire templates. And uh, the first step is electrodeposition from an organic electrolyte uh, so that uh, the hydrophobic CNT wires are wetted and infiltrated and the copper seeds are formed within the wires. And in the next step, we used a uh, typical copper sulfate I ache this electrodeposition to grow the copper seeds. And uh, in this case, uh, we used array spun commercial multiple CNT wires as a starting material to make our composites. And uh, we could scale up uh, the process to some extent uh, to make a spool. Um, and moving on to the second issue of exerting structural control and clarifying CNT, uh, composite structure versus performance. Uh, one, uh, one aspect of composite structure is the mixing. And we control the mixing, CNTCU mixing, by tuning electrodeposition parameters and choosing appropriate CNT wire templates. We could make three types of structures with different levels of CNTCU mixing and internal filling. The first is a full mixed structure where uh, the nanotubes and copper are completely mixed. 95% of copper is within the wire. And the second is a partial mixed structure uh, where the CNTs are mixed with discontinuous copper grains uh, with a uh, copper outer coating and only 43 weight percent of copper is inside the wire. The third is the no mix structure. It's just a core sheet sample where there's uh, no CTCU mixing in the bulk. 98 weight percent of copper is on the surface and only two weight percent is on the inside. Uh, so let's look at the performances. Um, uh, if we look at the electrical uh, conductivity at room temperature versus mixing, uh, what we see is the spatial distribution is vital for conductivity. And uh, it's a full mix samples, which uh, shows the highest values amongst the three types of sample, but also it's a hundred times 
uh, improvement over the NEED CNTY, which can be expected because we are adding copper. Uh, what's more interesting is uh, the temperature dependence of the conductance. Uh, the CUCNA wires show a different behavior versus uh, neat copper and the neat CNT wires. Uh, and the behavior also changes with mixing. So in, in the case of metallic copper, as we all know, the conductance decreases with temperature. In the case of this neat CNT wires, the conductance increases with temperature, which is similar to that of a conductor. And uh, the composite wires fall in between, basically uh, mixing the semiconducting behavior of CNTs and the metallic behavior of copper. And uh, uh, with the increase in uh, CUCNA mixing, uh, the conductance versus temperature slope reduces and the conductance becomes more temperature stable. And this temperature stability, as you all know, it's uh, expressed in terms of temperature coefficient of resistance or the more stable conductivity. And the full mix samples uh, show TCR of around 50% that of pure copper. And uh, this combination of uh, high conductivity and temperature stable conductivity is quite important for applications where wires get hot like motor windings or when wires are near aircraft or car engines. And I think CUCND wires can be promising for these applications. Uh, next, we also looked at the current stability of uh, of these wires as uh, current carrying capacity. Here as well, mixing is crucial and uh, the full mixed wire showed uh, the highest current carrying capacity amongst the three structure. And also interestingly, the full mix wire was actually better than that of copper. And uh, it's possible as hypo hypothesized in many studies uh, that uh, CNTs re reduce the copper electron migration. Um, we also looked at the thermal expansion stability of the composite wires. Um, uh, the inherently low thermal expansion of CNTs is transferred to copper, and uh, the composite wires basically show uh, lower CTs uh, than copper. And once again, the mixing level plays a vital role, uh, and the full mix wires. Um, uh, show CT is very similar to silicon or ceramics, um, around 4 ppm per degree C, which is 74% uh, reduction versus copper. Uh, so basically the film example combines the low CT, lightweight coming from the highest CND volume percent, uh, the wire form and the temperature stable high conductivity. And these materials are needed uh, for fatigue track resistant ceramic in insulated motor windings, especially for aircraft engines. So there's real application for this material. And, uh, and of course, for real application, we need uh, uh, mechanically robust material. So we tested the tensile robustness of our wires. And once again, the mixing was important and the full mix uh, wire showed the maximum strength among the three structure and they were as strong as commercial annealed drawn copper wires, even without any heat treatments or any post-processing. So there are the, there's some promise uh, to this material as a real world copper substitute. Of course, besides uh, mixing, there are other structural aspects um, that can affect the composite performances, like obviously the CNT structure, number of walls, diameter, length, metallicity, the alignment, of course, the copper structure, and, and also the CNT CU interface. And uh, we have addressed this in our review paper, which was published a few years ago. Um, so we recently tried to explore some of these aspects experimentally. And uh, in the next slides, I'll uh, try to present our results on the effect of uh, CNT structure and the interface on the composite performances. Uh, first, uh, we try to assess the composite performance versus nanotube attributes. Uh, for this, we fabricated composite different CNT attributes. Uh, we made uh, composite pillars uh, with around two nanometer diameter single ball aligned CNTs running end to end with a low G by D. And G by D is uh, a Raman metric, Raman spectroscopic metric, which is a ratio of the graphitic uh, G band to defect D band intensity. Uh, lower the G by D means low crystallinity. And uh, these structures were basically uh, geared more 
towards uh, through Silicon Via applications. And you might have heard about this more from my colleague yesterday, Dr. Gohashan's talk. Um, the other sample is a single uh, CNT core wires with a network uh, CNT structure. There are many ends and uh, also the CNTs are high crystallinity, which is seen from the G by D, uh, very high G by D. Uh, and uh, the wire composites uh, show good CUCNA mixing, but there are also many voids. Uh, in the pillar samples, there were not many voids. But when we look at the performances, despite the voids and all, uh, in general, the single wall CNT uh, copper composites showed a better conductivity and temperature stability than the multi wall uh, uh, stuff that we made. Um, and the conductivity of the single wall composites is basically of the same order of magnitude as that of copper and the TCRs 13, uh, almost one tenth of that of copper. Uh, these results not just indicate that the CUCNA perform performance is affected by the CAT structure, but also the promise that that can uh, uh, that this material can live up to. Uh, so basically, higher crystallinity, fewer and single wall tubes might be beneficial for composite performances. And uh, finally, uh, we tried to assess the composite performance by including an oxygen interface. And it's intended to improve the CNT-CU interactions. As you all know, copper and CNTs don't like each other. They don't easily wet each other because of the surface energy differences. Um, and including an oxygen interface can improve the wetting, but does it improve the electrical performances? So we tested this using some film composites. Uh, we optimally oxidized CNT films using mild ozone gas exposure, and we made our CUC composites uh, by simple EB deposition methods. And at an optimal uh, C to O atomic ratio of around two to one, uh, we did see an increase in conductivity and its temperature stability. And you can see from the SCM that uh, the uh, oxygen interface in, in reality does improve the wetting of copper and CNTs. Without uh, the oxygen interface, you see like large grains. With the oxygen interface, it's like very well uh, wetted, forming a smooth surface on the CNT films. <clears throat> So um, I've kind of reached the um, end of my talk, but before concluding, just a word on the future research. Um, this uh, research field of copper carbon nanotube composites is uh, rich with opportunities. And research questions basically fall into three categories. One is the why. Uh, why CUC and perform the way they do? The mechanistic aspects of the uh, composite performances remain open to be pursued. And the second question is how to improve performances, how to tailor beneficial structures, reliably and actual samples. And this leads to the third question, what? What are the beneficial structures in, in terms of the CNTs, copper and the CNTCU interface? So we will need to find answers to these questions to design composites with rivaling performances. And uh, here are our take home messages. Uh, we fabricated practically applicable uh, copper carbon nanotube composites as wires and as through silicon via structures, lighter than copper with uniform mixing. Uh, the composite performance is a rival, uh, that of copper in terms of electrical conductivity, heat, mechanical and current stability, uh, the CNTCU mixing, the individual nanotube structure, and the CNTCU interface determine the performances. And finally, uh, the composite, um, the CUCND composite field has uh, several open questions and has a very rich research potential. Um, I hope you enjoyed this talk. And finally, I'd like to thank all for their support. Thank you all for your attention. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to discuss. Thank you very much, knowing that it is 4 a.m. in Japan and uh, you gave a very clear and nice presentation. Uh, we have a, a short minute. So I just had a question of, you know, you're saying all the properties, but how about the cost? How does that compare? <laughs> That's a very good question. Um, well, I think uh, uh, once the CNT costs come down, uh, there'll, there'll be a, a real um, 
uh, that will be the real competition competitive factor. But I think the CNT costs are coming down. The, the synthesis methods are improving exponentially. Um, just yesterday, we heard a, a talk where people are using like machine learning uh, to improve CNT synthesis. Now, even though the synthesis is actually a crazy difficult multidimensional parameter space. Now people are able to do like thousand experiments uh, in a single day to find a parameter space for any specific kind of CNT. So um, I think the industry is the enlightenment phase. It's no longer in the hype cycle or in the trough of disillusionment. So I think there is hope, yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you for, for the talk again. If there are any additional questions, please add them uh, into the chat. Uh, our next talk is an uh, invited talk. Uh, I believe uh, Professor uh, Rinaldi is here to give it. It's the biofactory mediated and biomimetric approaches for the synthesis of silicon oxide based nanostructures for multiple applications. Okay, so thank you very much for the introduction. I will share my screen. So, can you see it? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you for, very much for the introduction and for the invitation to this very nice, interesting conference. And today I will show a novel biotechnological approach to the preparation of iridium doped luminescence silica based nanostructures. And then I will show a new methodology that is a biomimetic, bio inspired design and synthesis of structural and functional hybrid organic and organic silicon dioxide-based uh, nanostructures. So let's start with the first topic. So the biotechnological approach to synthesize luminescent uh, silica nanostructures. Uh, for this kind of uh, experiment, uh, we were using diatoms. Diatoms are microalgae unicellular microalgae with very nice and intricate nanopatterned silicated cell walls that you can see here. Uh, this is the ABS mapping of the diatom frustus of this uh, um, microalgae that we use in the experiment. It is called the Thalassiosira oesiflogi. And the biosilication process occurs inside of the body of this unicellular organism, and in particular, uh, inside of this silica deposition vesicle, there is a, a polycondensation effect uh, for the silicic acid uh, that leads to the formation of silica nanoparticle. Then, uh, by means of the interaction of this uh, silicon precursor with silafins or long chain polyamines inside of the uh, silica deposition vesicles, uh, it is possible to generate this very nice nanopattern uh, that compose the diatom crystals. The organism is composed by two valves face to face uh, connected by lateral grids. So we wanted to use this kind of microalgae like a marine biofactory uh, to produce uh, nanosystems, hybrid and nanosystems with luminescence properties. Uh, in this case, we doped the, the diatoms with the, an organic, uh, organometallic complex that you can see here. And then we find two different strategies to extract the nanoparticles. So, so this kind of top-down extraction of silica nanostructures from different biosources, we are using this marine biosources, uh, represents an uh, environmentally friendly uh, biotechnological and local strategies to the synthesis of this kind of nanoproducts. So you can see here the nice, uh, very nice uh, TEM images of the diatom crustals of the microalgae and the structure of the organ organometallic uh, iridium-based compound. 
So after the doping uh, in vivo of the diatoms uh, by means of this uh, fluorescent uh, compound, we were able to measure the emission properties by means of fluorescence microscopy. Uh, you can see here these uh, uh, images of living diatoms. And in the first column, you can see the red fluorescence coming from the chloroblast of the algae. And this is an indication of the cell's viability. In the second column, you can see the green luminescence coming from the emitter, so the iridium complex. And in particular, you can recognize the two boxes shape of the microalga and the silicon deposition vesicle. By merging the two, image, the two images, we were able to see different time points after the doping that the luminescence is coming from inside of the cell bodies of our uh, photosynthetic microalgae. So uh, after all, we uh, decided to extract uh, silica nanoparticles. The first uh, procedure we carried out was a purification methodology of the diatoms crustals based on hard cleaning method. That is uh, um, a mixture of acidic components and oxidative step. In this case, uh, unfortunately, it was not possible to preserve the photoluminescence of the iridium doped uh, diatom crystals, but it was possible to extract very nice, very small silicon uh, nanoparticles, spherical nanoparticles, with uh, diameters of about, in average, of about three nanometers, and the spread in the uh, shape and the size ranging from 1.5 up to 10 nan nanometers. Then uh, we wanted to um, proceed with another methodology. So we purified the diatom crystals by means of a soft cleaning method. And in this case, we were able to uh, obtain an hybrid uh, organic, inorganic uh, uh, clusters that you can see here in the image, in the EM image. In this case, uh, we have a higher diameter in the cluster, but we were able to preserve the uh, emission properties. As you can see here in the orange dotted line that represent the emission of our hybrid clusters. This is also compared in this graph with the uh, photoluminescence of the bare solid iridium compounds while that is represented the green dotted line, while the black dotted line represents the emission from the silica nanoparticle that we extracted with the previous methodology. And this confirms that there is no emission from the silica nanoparticles. So the reason for that is, uh, um, um, is due to the fact that uh, the uh, organometallic complex interacts strongly with the organic component inside of the diatoms, so with the silicates, and also it is embedded in the cluster. So the system is fluorescent. The application of this structure can be found in the sensing uh, application in the, the catalysis, and also there are some applications in the field of uh, photonics and plasmonics. So, Let's turn to the second part of the talk. So the novel synthesis of silica dioxide-based particles by means of a biomimetic approach. In this case, by following what happens in nature inside of this microalgae, we were able to reproduce the process in the laboratory just by uh, putting together the silicic acid and the short chain polyamines in one single pot at room temperature to my condition, we were able to obtain very nice silicon dioxide particle that you can see here in our TM image. While here you can see a sketch of the aggregation process. We end up with a very nice shape of this particle and you can see here in the TM, TM image of the cross-sectional, ultramicrotome cross-sectional of this particle that they resemble the Pac-Man-like structure. So 
just by changing the reaction condition in terms of time, temperature, reagent ratio, solvent, volume, and steering, we were able to accurately tailor the properties of the silica dioxide nanostructures in terms of size, density, porosity, surface area, and organic and organic composition. And you can see here different, um, different products of our uh, uh, reactions and grow uh, procedures. Then we wanted to uh, expose uh, our silica nanoparticle to the silica things uh, that we were using in the procedure. In particular, we exposed again the nanoparticle to the spermidin, that is one of uh, the uh, silica things of the polyamines that naturally are uh, inside of this microalgae. And by exposing again the nanoparticle to the spermidin, it is possible to observe a process of emptying out of the structure and also the covering of the outside surface of the particle by means of the spermidin. So you can see here a different uh, time point of the grow process that we ends up with this system that we call all of nanopores spermidin decorated pod. So the spermidin allows the emptying of the structure and then the functionalization of the porous surfaces. And you can see here very well the process in this high magnification TM image. This is the final product. Here we report the SEM image of, two, uh, of the two systems, nano system that we produced. On the left, you can see the silicon dioxide, uh, dioxide nanostructure with the hole on the top. And on the right, you can see this uh, spermidine decorated nanoporous pod that are empty, as you can see, very porous and covered by the spermidine. Moreover, it is possible to observe in the cage of the structure four lobes, at, um, as it is also confirmed by the cross-sectional analysis that you can see here. As an application, uh, we wanted to use this spermidine decorated nanoporous spots as a smart nanocarrier for oligonucleotide delivery. In this case, the electrostatic inter interaction of the spermidine with the MIRNA uh, makes possible the attraction of the MIRNA on the surface of the system and also the uh, englobation of the birna inside of the cavity. Therefore, this is a strategy, a good strategy to enhance the cargo loading and delivery of the birna into the cellular body. We used as birna the uh, one called 34A3P, that is a well known tumor suppressor. And it is worth noting also that another expression of the polyamine transport system, it is often found in various cancer types. And also we were able to enhance the targeted delivery strategies by using this kind of polyamine transport system uh, in order to promote a selectivity and penetration of these conjugates into the tumor cells. This is the result of our experiment. We performed the experiment on the human melanoma cell lines. And you can see here the nuclei of the cells stained in blue and the fluorescence of the microRNA in green. And the merging of the two confocal microscopy images are represented here. In the um, magnification of the image, it is possible to see that the microRNA are inside of the cell body. Moreover, we uh, were able to see that the whole of spermidine decorated silica nanoporous pod were uh, able to improve the oligonucleotide loading phase efficiency by factor 20% with respect to the silica nanoparticles that we extracted in the first type of growth technique. Then we studied the, the dissolution rate of this particle as a function of the pH in order to perform a pH, uh, a pH, uh, um, a pH controlled delivery along the time inside of the cellular uh, culture. 
And then uh, finally, we tested the functional activity of the uh, delivery system decorated and, and loaded with the MIRNA uh, in terms of apoptosis on the uh, tumor cell lines. And we were able to find an increase of 2.5 fold of the apoptosis of the tumor cell line with respect to the control that we uh, did in the same cell line with a scrub of CIRNA. Therefore, we uh, were able to do this kind of application. And in conclusion, I think that I convinced you that the design of novel hybrid biosynthesized and biodynamic architectures can represent a powerful approach for achieving advanced and smart materials with multiple functionalities and for various application and purposes like photonic and imaging, sensing biomedicine, biomedicine drug delivery and theranostics, and so and also for uh, gene delivery strategies as we uh, demonstrated. So I would like to acknowledge my collaborators and thank you for your kind attention. I'm happy to answer to uh, some questions if any. Uh, thank you, Professora. Um, the, uh, please add questions to uh, the chat if you have any questions. Is the last uh, speaker here? If not, there is a, a, contribu a video contribution. And so we can use that to kind of play out to the end of the session. So I'd like to uh, thank all of the speakers uh, for uh, being here and, and for giving their uh, nice talks across uh, a, broad, a broad array of um, composite functional materials. Thank you. Hello to everyone. My name is Francesca Schon. I'm professor of structural engineering at the University of Salerno in Italy. The title of my presentation is GFRP full adhesive connection mechanical aspects. This one is the overview of my uh, presentation. When we speak about GFRP material, generally we speak about protruded material because they are obtained by the industrial uh, technique called protrusion is uh, schematically represented in this uh, slide. Strictly speaking, a, a protruded profile is a profile obtained by uh, uh, fiberglass aligned horizontally each other, immersed in a, a, a resin, in order to obtain the final products as here uh, reported. This kind of material has been used since 2000 in order to realize uh, entire um, uh, GFRP structure like these two buildings in, uh, uh, in, in Helsinki and in uh, Basilea, as well as in order to uh, realize bridges like the Aberfeldy Bridge and the Leda Bridge in Spain. More recently, this kind of material, due to uh, 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 its high corrosion resistance, have been used in order to realize a structure strictly in contact with water, like cooling water or like bridges, but uh, um, close to the uh, river. In order to further increase the use of this kind of material, especially in the field of civil engineering, there are uh, four hot topics that need to be deeply invest further investigated. They are the durability of GFRP and resins, the type of uh, connection, uh, bolted or adhesive connection, the, the necessity to have a simple mechanical models in order to predict the strength and stiffness of this kind of connection and the fire resistance. This topic uh, has been investigated by me in collaboration with several uh, researchers from my university and uh, foreign uh, university and also thanks to the support of uh, national and international industries uh, uh, like the Fiberline from Denmark, Topglass and Mascherpa from uh, Italy. Recently, in uh, 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 
uh, Europe uh, have been done uh, uh, um, have uh, been drawing a, 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 a new record about the use of uh, FRP as in this slide uh, reported. The main research goal of uh, my uh, current uh, activity is uh, the, uh, the, the study of, from an experimental and mechanical point of view of the mechanical behavior of a GFRP full adhesive connection taking into account the particular aspect of the hygrothermal aging. In order to uh, do uh, this, uh, a large experimental program has been assessed, is, a, is an ongoing ex experimental program, uh, and uh, 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 today I'll show you the uh, experimental results and the, the uh, related numerical results of a part of this uh, experimental program, but we will speak about the different load condition uh, uh, bending or uh, uh, shear about uh, 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 the, uh, the influence of uh, the bonding uh, uh, of the bonding uh, area. In particular, we will uh, we have selected three type of uh, connection: type one, in which we have the uh, connection, the full adhesive connection. Uh, in which uh, uh, the bonding area is composed of the overlap between the column and the beam and also by the presence of two angles uh, 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 in the upper side and in the lower side in order to increase the bonding area. The type 2 is uh, exactly equal to the type 1 but the horizontal side is not 90 but 65. Type 3 the horizontal side is uh, 40. Type 4 is uh, related to the shear test where we have uh, the um, full adhesive connection, substantially uh, type 1A, uh, but loaded in, uh, in shear. This one is a, a, a photo of the prototype under the bending test and under the shear test. This one is the uh, type 1, the horizontal side is 90, this one is the, uh, the prototype uh, which the horizontal side is 65, in this case is the horizontal side is 40. Uh, uh, in order to uh, perform the experimental test, we use LVDT, 6 LVDT for the beam, 3 LVDT for the column, also the digital image correlation technique in order to evaluate the shear distribution over the bonding uh, uh, area. This one is uh, the photo of the data acquisition system. This one are, uh, um, what about the type of failure? This one is uh, the, the prototype before uh, the test, is an intermediate step where the load is increased and this one is at failure. For this kind of, uh, uh, of connection, uh, we have a mixed uh, uh, failure. In the case of uh, we, uh, in, in the case of no angles, uh, we have a different kind of failure characterized by a cohesive failure inside the uh, material. Uh, this one are the mixed failure of the other case of. Uh, uh, connection over the horizontal side is uh, 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 is decreased. In general, we can say that uh, the uh, failure is mixed when um, angles is uh, present. Is uh, uh, inside the adhesive where uh, 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 angles are uh, uh, absent. Um, uh, uh, this one is uh, uh, the uh, failure under the shear uh, test. This one is a, 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 a very typical because we don't have a failure inside the adhesive, but we have a failure inside the GFRP. And in particular, as here reported, we have a completely the, the separation between the flange of the beam to the web of the, uh, of the beam, as in this photo reported. 
this is just a, a, a little video in order to uh, underline the brittle failure of this kind of uh, adhesive uh, uh, connection. And this one is the, uh, the video of the, uh, the failure under the shear uh, test. Here we have also uh, uh, results summarized in terms of uh, uh, bonding area, failure loads, uh, uh, um, uh, and, failure, uh, and failure moment. In order to, an to analyze the, uh, the experimental results, we can start to compare the results for uh, varying uh, the, uh, the bonding area and in particular to uh, having to have the, uh, the same age of the bonding area but varying uh, the horizontal side from 90 to 40. As is possible to uh, obtain, in this case we have a, a decrease of uh, the failure load as well as the decrease of uh, stiffness moving from type 1a to type 3 and these also are the m theta uh, 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 curves uh, another result uh, is uh, 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 the presence or the absence of, uh, of angles. Uh, also here we have reported the P delta curves uh, and it's uh, quite clear that uh, if we not consider the, uh, the angles is in, the, in, uh, in, in, uh, in this case as we can see the failure load is completely lower than uh, the other cases uh, um, two times lower and the same is possible to see in terms of M rotation, uh, moment rotation uh, uh, curves. Um, uh, last but not least is uh, the comparison between the bending and shear load condition. The uh, 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 connection tested is the same, is the full connection where the bonding area is, uh, uh, is the same. As it, as it is possible to see, we have a completely two different load uh, uh, level because in the case of a shear test, the load rise up uh, um, uh, 50,000 uh, uh, Newton and uh, uh, failure, I remember you, is, is, is in the GFRP, not in the adhesive, while where bending is considered, the failure load is more or less is uh, uh, less than twenty thousand, and the failure is in the uh, adhesive. So, in order uh, to uh, predict the failure load of a full adhesive bin to column uh, connection, taking taking into account that in pre when uh, uh, bending the low bending load condition is considered, the failure is is inside the adhesive. A possible simple mechanical model in order to predict the uh, strength and stiffness of the connection is to use the model of a simply um, lap uh, joint uh, with an interfacial law where, where the adhesive is characterized by, the, by a rigid softening interfacial law and is also uh, here is uh, repre uh, represented the, the uh, uh, the model. So, in the connection, we consider uh, that we have bending inside uh, the beam. We relate the um, uh, load uh, air. To the external load P, uh, 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 very simply by uh, satisf uh, satisfying the, uh, the equilibrium, and uh, uh, um, uh, the mechanical aspects of the uh, uh, modelization as based on the approach presented and, vali and uh, validated by myself in these two previous uh, papers. 
In particular, uh, the uh, hypothesis of the model are, are at that the bottom adherent is uh, rigid, in this case is the column, the bonding is uh, perfect, and the uh, interfacial law in order to describe the behavior of the resin is a rigid softening. The governing equation of the uh, problem are this one, so we have only a, 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 an axial uh, uh, force, this is, uh, uh, is, is the uh, uh, equation, um, and this one is uh, the uh, uh, final expression of uh, 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 stress. Uh, for, uh, what about the general solution and, and boundary condition? This is, is the general uh, uh, solution where S is the, uh, is the slip, is the horizontal relative displacement between the upper adherent and the lower uh, adherent. These one are the two uh, boundary con uh, uh, conditions that we have to fix in order to obtain the two uh, constant A1 and, uh, B, uh, and B1. And the solution in this case, considering the um, hypothesis of interfacial law rigid softening, is a cross form solution. This is very uh, uh, important. The solution, as you can say, is a function of, of R, and R is, uh, stick, is uh, related to the uh, external load as previously described. This one is the solution in terms of uh, slip. This solution is a function of cosine and, uh, and, uh, and sin by multiplying by uh, uh, omega s and uh, adding this uh, uh, quantity. It's possible to obtain the, uh, mm, the uh, uh, effective bonding uh, uh, length, Lf. And uh, uh, the, from this uh, uh, LF is possible to ob obtain the closed form solution in terms of uh, uh, axial maximum uh, axial force of the uh, uh, of the joint as here uh, uh, reported. Uh, uh, it is well known that when we speak about uh, an adhesive joints. Uh, uh, it is very um, uh, important to evaluate the effective bonding length because of for a length greater than the effective bonding length it's not possible that the joint is able to uh, have a, 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 it's not possible for the uh, for the joint to have a maximum a greater uh, uh, axial uh, force. So, in our cases, uh, and uh, taking into account that the effective bonding length is a function of the mechanical properties of the adhesive, for uh, uh, our connection and for the, our joints, taking into, in, into consideration that the adhesive is, uh, uh, is uh, araldite, in this case, as uh, uh, in the next clarified, the effective bonding length is equal to 30 uh, to 73 uh, millimeter. So we have uh, two cases uh, where um, 40 millimeter and 65 millimeter that we have uh, introduced before in the experimental program, they are lower than the uh, bonding effective length. And we have also the length of 90 millimeter is greater than the uh, effective uh, length. In order to evaluate the, um, uh, the displacement uh, uh, delta under the uh, uh, load P, then in order to uh, uh, reproduce the P delta experimental curve and also in order to reproduce the stiffness of the connection, uh, um, is necessary to introduce the rotational stiffness of the connection. So we can we can uh, uh, we can obtain uh, easily from the principle of virtual work the displacement uh, delta function of all these uh, elastic uh, contribution in some cases of the beam in some cases of the column, and the uh, last terms is relative to the 
uh, is uh, to the connection that we have model introduced uh, in the middle of the in the core of the connection and uh, uh, an inch plus a rotational spring. In this equation, obviously, we have E0 is the young modulus of GFRP uh, parallel to the fiber uh, direction, while K phi is the connection or rotational stiffness. Uh, we have also proposed the formula for the evaluation of uh, uh, connection or rotational stiffness K phi and uh, uh, is here uh, reported is a function of geometric and mechanical properties strictly related to the adhesive. G stay for glue, so we have the elastic modulus of uh, adhesive layer. Tg is the thickness of the adhesive layer. Bg is this uh, quantity and Hg is this quantity as here. If we want to discuss about the, the influence of a quantity Bg, we fix the value of H equal to 270 as done in the experimental program and considering the case of 90 millimeter, 65 millimeter, 40 uh, uh, millimeter and the last but not least is uh, here is not reported but you have a BG of 120 millimeter. As it's possible to see in black we have the experimental curves and in red we have the numerical prediction as it's possible to see by using uh, uh, the two mechanical models, one, in or, uh, one for evaluating the failure load and one for evaluating the uh, displacement at the same cross-section where the load is applied, it's possible to predict very well the strength and stiffness of the connection and the model takes, takes in, into account also the variation of the bonding uh, Last but not least, if we want to discuss about the, uh, uh, the, uh, the influence of young modulus of uh, uh, the glue, we can make a comparison with the, uh, the current experimental program and in particular we select the case in which we, BG is 90, AG is 270, the thickness is 1 mm the adhesive is, is uh, araldite and the young modulus is 2000 megapascal and the GFRP material is from top glass and E0 is equal to 20,000 megapascal. We can uh, compare these results with the previous experimental program in which we have a different uh, a BG and a different HG, a different thickness and also a different kind of resin. This one is the Cicador 30 where the young modulus of this resin is more or less five times bigger than before. In this case the also E0 is different from the previous connection, uh, from the previous, um, from the current experimental program because of the, uh, uh, the value is uh, uh, 28,000 megapascal and in particular this uh, uh, profile were produced by Fiberland. These, uh, these, uh, the results of this uh, experimental program are, are also published in this, uh, in this paper. As it is possible to see, the uh, mechanical model is perfectly able to understand that a completely different material in terms of GFRP and in terms of uh, adhesive has been, um, uh, uh, has been uh, used. In conclusion, the behavior of a full adhesive GFRP joints was deeply investigated from an experimental point of view, taking into account several different geometries, load condition, as well as the, the hydrothermal aging. 
the bending load caused the premature failure of the adhesive. The failure load of the connection could be predicted by a simple mechanical model, single lap joint with rigid softening interface low, which solution is form closed. The displacement in the same cross section where the load is applied could be predicted by introducing the rotational stiffness of the connection. A simple formula is proposed for the rotational spring stiffness depending on the geometric and the mechanical properties of the adhesive layer. The mechanical model is capable to predict the failure load taking into account the variation of the geometry as well as the mechanical properties of the adhesive layer. The ongoing research, uh, we are um, uh, the prediction of the rotation of the co uh, connection, the influence of hygrothermal uh, aging, and the use of a new adhesive with a better performance in terms of a glass transition temperature. Thank you for your attention. Thank you everyone for coming. So I guess this is the end of the session. If you have any questions, you could uh, send a message to uh, to Ascom uh, to his email, or you can uh, leave the questions in the chat and we can ask these questions. And uh, so that's it, have a good day.
Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this new session, a poster session. I will be the chair of this session. We have six minutes left to start. So I will just tell everyone that the, every poster presentation time is only three minutes. So please try to be try to finish this uh, presentation within the stipulated time. But anyway, 20, 30 seconds is not a very big problem. Maybe all participants are not presenting. So let's try to finish in time. Thank you. Sir. Hello. We will be the first presenter. So we wait about three, four minutes. Then we can sure. start. Um, would you like me to share my screen to see the poster as well? Or um, will you be yeah, sharing you the poster? Share, for you? you have to share your screen. Okay. I'll do that. Poster, yeah. Uh, uh, sorry to interrupt, Dr. Paul, can you just see your messages? I, we just send you a couple of messages. You send me a message? Yeah, in the chat. So can you see the message? No, I, I'm checking the chat. In the I Zooms? Okay, so just let me send you again. Uh, can you please see? Can you see it now? No. Okay. So, uh, if not, I can just just let you know over here. Yes. Please. Yeah. So please, uh, uh, please during the, uh, during your session, uh, please select two best posters and then just let us know by email. Okay. Okay, because we will give like the poster award and uh, so just please select like two best posters from the list. This is it. Okay. okay, thank you. Okay, thank you.
okay <clears throat> Good everyone we can start with the first presentation will be presented by Oxoy Nagar and his uh, title of this work is nonlinear optical organic inorganic nanocomposites DSPAO okay Oxoy you can start okay hi everyone um is my volume okay can you hear me you have to see at the screen yeah. Okay. So can you, can everyone see my screen and hear me well? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, I'll try to stay within the three minutes. Um, so hi everyone, my name is Akshay Nagar. I am a graduate student at Brown University with the Laboratory of Emerging Technologies. And today I wanna to talk a little bit about a new composite material that we've been developing for the purpose of optical sensing in the low stress regime. Up until this point, there's been quite a bit of work done in sensing in the high stress regime where stress can reach the order of megapascals. But when the stress is orders of magnitude lower than that, the space for sensors remains relatively unexplored. Uh, it's important to be able to address this issue because small stresses can often go undetected in buildings, uh, leading to deformations which when left unchecked can degrade a building's structural integrity and eventually lead to uh, total collapse. Um, Actually, a striking example of this happened earlier this year when a 12-story Surfside condo in Florida collapsed due to constant water damage uh, in, the, in the foundation over many, many years. Um, there were these small stresses that built up and went unnoticed and, or were too hard to detect, and eventually the building collapsed, uh, resulting in many casualties. And to address such tragedies, we have, um, we're working to develop a scalable and distributed stress sensor that is sensitive to low levels of stress. Um, the material that we propose as a candidate for this is, um, is a composite that's made up of two distinct parts. The first is an anodized aluminum oxide template. Um, AAO is a porous material that can be integrated into many different structures and is scalable in nature. Into the pores of AAO, we plan to fill a nonlinear optical organic crystal known as DAST, um, which is also scalable in nature, but is also known for its exceptionally high chi 2 value, which gives it very bright second harmonic generation. We've shown in a previous work submitted to the Conference of Lasers and Electro Optics earlier this year that this chi 2 value can be enhanced by external strain, but the focus of this work is the enhancement of the chi 2 via internal strain. The internal strain is created by injecting liquid dust into the AAO pores, resulting in a Laplace force that, that comes when a liquid is confined in a cylindrical geometry. Um, the, uh, the Laplace force that we see here is inversely proportional to the radius of the tube. Um, and since we have nanometer sized tubes in AAO, um, we expect that there will be a correspondingly large uh, Laplace force and uh, eventually a large uh, enhancement of the second order nonlinearity. Um, I think, I think I, I've timed myself this, this, I think right about where I ran out of time. Um, so I will just end by saying that we have started to gather preliminary data uh, on, this, uh, on this hypothesis. And if people would like to know more about it, I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, here I have some diagrams also explaining sort of the, uh, the mechanics of this Laplace force. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that's, uh, I think that's about all I can present in this time. So I'm happy to answer any questions. And I thank the session chair uh, for his time here, for all, to all of you for listening and to the session organizers uh, for giving me the opportunity to speak here. And now I'm open for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. You are in time. So I think we cannot discuss much questions on such due to time limit, but anybody sure. wants to uh, ask any question or doubt so we can put the question in the chat box and I'll send this message to the uh, presenter and later we'll communicate. So he will, the presenter will communicate the person directly. So I think that this is fine. Otherwise, we cannot finish in time. That's the problem. So please, if we have question, please write in the chat box. Okay. And put your Put your email so that we can we can uh, convey this question to the presenter. Thank you very much, Absar. Thank you. Okay. So our next speaker. Snappy.
Justina, Pilt, and Sewell present the novel exploitation protocols for capacitor lifetime enhancement. Okay, welcome. Hello everyone, my name is Justyna Piwek. I come from Poznan University of Technology in Poland. Today I would like to speak about the novel exploitation protocol for capacitor lifetime enhancement. So our previous studies on the aging phenomena with the lithium nitrate as electrolyte showed that only the positive electrode oxidizes. However, the properties of the negative electrode remained unchanged. In order to fully use both electrodes, we decided to verify alternate floating protocol in order to extend capacitor lifetime. Alternate floating consists of the charging-discharging cycles with alternate polarization that allowed both electrodes to play the role of the positive and negative one. Different moral concentration of the lithium nitrate were investigated in order to verify electrolyte concentration influence on long-term performance. Standard floating protocol and alternate one were compared. All the capacitor systems were tested until 20% of the capacitance fade. As we can see here, for the low concentration, operation time was almost doubled. However, the higher electrolyte concentration, the smaller improvement. When we observe cyclic voltammograms, we can see that after alternate floating, much different shape is observed than in the case of the standard one. So it indicates that in this case, uh, a higher electrode damage is observed than in the case of the standard floating. This is actually confirmed by the post-mortem studies. Uh, specific surface area and the XPS was uh, measured. We see that uh, with the standard floating protocol, almost no specific surface area was observed for the negative electrode. However, for the alternate one, uh, we see the decrease, what indicates a higher oxidation of these electrodes after alternate floating, what is confirmed by XPS studies. To conclude, application of the alternate floating uh, allows cycle life to be successfully extended. Superior lifetime of, of the capacitor can be achieved by application of more concentrated electrolytic solutions and by utilization of the alternate floating protocol. However, the most beneficial results are obtained for the moderate concentration. It's worth highlighting that besides capacitor lifetime improvement, this work presents the possibility of the sustainable and cost-effective approach. Thank you for your attention. I would like to acknowledge ERC grant. If you would like to uh, read more, please visit our paper. Hello everyone, my name is Ustina Piwek. I come from Okay, thank you very much for a nice presentation. If anyone had questions again, please please uh, put this your question in the chat box. I'll convey the questions to the speaker. So we can pass to the third presentation of the session. It will be presented by Daniel Durchet. Okay, and it will be on novel magnetoelectric oxide, copper oxide. Do we have see? next speaker? Excuse me? Do we have next speaker? If not, I will share his video. Yeah. If, he, if the person is not there, I can project. I can I can put it. I, I put it now. Wait a minute. Yes, I'm putting it here.
sorry, Professor Paul, there is no sound of your video. Yes, yeah. You Let me check. Yes, I don't know. I'm sorry. Strange. If you need me, it might help. Um, I am your uh, assistant. Actually, I can play the video. Sure. Please. Yeah, I can play the video. Just wait me a minute. This one. Paramelaconite is the third copper oxide in addition to cuprous and cupric oxides. It was discovered in 1891 and it is a mixed valence compound indicated by spin 1 over 2. In 1978 the XRD was evaluated and the structure consists of a pilochrome lattice having four unit formulas in the unit cell. In 2004 the French group reported from the mineral sample the neutron scattering and the AC susceptibility data and the latter reveals the antiferromagnetic transition at 42.3 kelvins. In 2014, the Croatian group reported the first bulk reparation of paramelaconite, 10 to 100 grams per batch. The paramelaconite was confirmed by XRD, AC susceptibility and neutron scattering. Figure 3 shows the high resolution AC susceptibility performed by Prester and Roberts from Institute of Physics in Zagreb, Croatia. The results revealed the antiferromagnetic transition at 44.7 kelvins and two additional magnetic transitions at higher temperature. Figure 4 shows electric resistance dependent on frequency with strong, strong magnetoelectric coupling indicated by the resonance at 36.52 kHz. The evaluated dielectric permittivity x6.6 times 10 to the 6th and the magnetic permittivity of 3790, where the latter is in an agreement with the susceptibility data. The upper curve presents the temperature dependence of the resistance at resonant frequency and the constant value is extended up to 775 kelvins. Figure 5 shows calculated magnetic interaction parameters and figure 6 shows calculated density of states. Both figures are calculated by Gikwech and De Love from University of Utrecht, the Netherlands. Figure 7 shows infrared spectra. Calculated by Gikwech and De Love from University of Utrecht, the Netherlands and measured at the Ruger Boschkovich Institute, Zagreb, Croatia. Thank you very much. Okay, let's pass to the next session. Next session will be presented by Rosik Osama, and the title will be Preclinical Efficacy of MECA 79 Anti CD3 Nanoparticles in Reversing Type 1 Diabetes. I don't know whether the presenter is there or not. Is there, Rosik, there? No, so please, uh, uh, can you please uh, run the poster, please? Oh, I, I just checked. Uh, a, a, he or she didn't send us the poster, so we can skip this one. Okay, I have here. Here, the problem is the sound and the phone. Poster? No, I don't have either. He didn't. He didn't upload. This yes, so, yes, we have the next one. Yeah, we have the next one is the poster, fifth poster, it's production of green 70 years composites. Okay, it will be presented by Adrian Chajik, Chajik of Poland. Is Adrian there? No? And can you please run the poster five, please? Sure, sure. Thanks. Everyone. My name is Adrian Hayez. I am a PhD student at Wrocław University of Science and Technology, Poland. 
My supervisor is Professor Łukasz Sadowski. Let me introduce the topic of my poster. Production of green cementitous composites, granite powder utilization. First, I would like to say what granite powder waste is. It is formed during the processing of granite rocks. You can see the whole process here. The result of it is a granite powder that currently has no significant industrial use. This waste is stored in heaps, which has a major impact on the environmental, causing landslide, water pollution and pneumoconies in humans. Granite powder has a grain similar to cement and its chemical composition consists mainly of SeO2. Next figure presents the scanning electron microscope image of granite powder. All this means that a method of utilization of this waste is actively sought. One idea is to use it for the production of cementitous composites. The appropriate combination of cement, granite powder and other components of cementitous mixes allow obtaining a composite with similar mechanical properties but positive ecological reaction on the environment. We performed research that showed that composites modified with the addition of granite powder have a higher bulk density, increased water absorption and similar volume porosity as samples consisting only the cement. Additionally, we checked the mechanical properties after 7, 28 and 90 days of mixing. After 7 days, the compressive strength of granite powder modified composites is close to the reference but with time it decreases and the differences arise. Thanks to the conducted research it can be stated with that the addition of granite powder to cementitious mixes is a topic with a great potential and requires future more detailed research. Thank you very much for your attention. Hello everyone, my name is Okay, so if anybody has question on this poster also they can write, even the presenter is absent, but we can convey these questions to them so he can answer or she can answer. So our next presenter is Hyo Seon Hyon, Se Hyon Hyo. Okay, its topic is self adaptive radiative thermostat to surrounding temperature variation. <clears throat> so, I don't know if it's see there or not. I think due to time difference, um, there's yes. yeah. If you cannot unmute um, yourself, please raise your hand. You can find reactions and uh, uh, click reactions and raise your hand so we can see you. Yeah, please. I don't think it's there. Yeah. I can share so, the screen. Yeah. We have this one, but, but with sound. Yeah. Please. Hello. Thank you for being here. This is Heon Hao, who is studying with the guidance of Professor Yong Min Song in Gwangju Institute of Science and Technology in South Korea. The topic of my presentation today is self adaptive radiative thermostat to surrounding temperature variation. Globally, we are facing an energy problem. Is there a way to avoid the use of air conditioners or heaters to deal with the cold and heat? Passive radiator cooling is a method that does not use energy for cooling by throwing heat towards the universe. The key principle is electromagnetic radiation, which carry energy by electromagnetic wave without any matter. Recent days, it's also drawn many attention for heating as well as cooling by passive way.
However, most of them use additional energy or stimulation to change heating and cooling states. Here, we suggest surrounding temperature adaptive radiative thermostat to realize completely passive way for winter heating and summer cooling. The design changes its cooling and heating state depends on setting temperature point. Our sample naturally achieves its cooling state when the surrounding temperature is low and heating when it's cooled. According to the equation, the power is inverse at its design point to reach summarily stable state. And finally, it can reach 9.6 degrees Celsius heating and 7.4 degrees Celsius of cooling when surrounding temperature is 0 and 30 degrees Celsius in ideal case. Finally, we fabricate the design by coating using porous PMMA on copper film. The coating thickness of porous PMMA controls the solar transparency. We extract the combination of around 14% of solar absorption layer at 0.25 to 2.5 micron with around 85% of heat radiation layer at 8 to 13 micron. The outdoor experiment shows that design sample shows it's heating about 2 and cooling of minus 2 degrees Celsius compared to the ambient air. This demonstration shows efficient thermal regulation technique using zero energy. Thank you for your attention. Okay, if anybody has a question, they can ask as I told, I will not tell every time. So we'll pass to the next poster, which will be presented by Nam Sun Yum on the sinter sintering mechanism of core cell metal metal oxide nanoparticles. I don't know whether he is there, he is there. Nam Sun Yong. She's not here. I'll play video instead. Okay, please. My name is Nam Sun. I'm a postdoc from Lund University in Sweden. My poster is about the sintering mechanism of core shell nanoparticles. Sintering of nanoparticles is important because how the shape and the structure of nanoparticles change due to sintering has huge impact on the performance of the functional nanoparticles in given applications. Sintering mechanisms of pure crystalline metal nanoparticles had been investigated previously, but there was no study on particles that have crystalline metal core with amorphous metal oxide shell. And because these metal metal oxide core shell system itself is gathering much attention as a functional nanoparticle, we studied their sintering behavior by using molecular dynamics. So we prepared three different types of metal, metal oxide core shell nanoparticles, which exhibit crystalline core and amorphous metal oxide shell after equilibrium at given temperatures. Then we let the nanoparticles merge and coalesce together and studied how the atoms diffuse during the sintering process. Here it shows how two nickel nickel oxide core shell nanoparticles coalesce over a period of time and for the other two types of nanoparticles as well a common feature we observed in all three types of nanoparticles is that the core atoms do not diffuse across the boundary zone between the two clusters and the surface atoms do not diffuse onto the other side of the nanoparticle surface either but of course, if we plot and compare the mean square displacement, MSD, of surface atoms and core atoms, we can see that the surface atoms are the one diffuse more and therefore contribute to the sintering processes. So in that sense, the mechanism here was similar to that of the pure crystalline metal nanoparticles. One thing that was quite interesting was that when we traced the atomic trajectory, we could see that the diffusion was highly localized. 
What we mean by that is, as we can see here, for example, we are tracing the atoms that are far away from the contact region, and we can see that the atoms remain pretty much where they were while the sintering progresses quite significantly. And this is quite contrasting to the commonly known concept of the high mobility of liquid-like surface atoms and surface diffusion of nanoparticles. Thank you for watching, and for more detailed information, please read my poster. Okay. <clears throat> so we pass to the next session, so next poster, poster number nine. Uh, poster number eight, okay, it will be presented by Maria Alexandrova on the study of hybrid infrared detector detectors with perovskite films and quantum dots. Is Maria there? Yeah. Hello, yes, I'm here. Yeah, thank you. I'm sharing the screen. Yeah. I'm sorry, something happened with the PowerPoint presentation. I'll be right now. Okay, I think now it should be visible. So uh, I'm from Technical University of Sofia, Department of uh, Microelectronics. Uh, and uh, the aim of our study is uh, to prepare low dimensional tin based uh, perovskite uh, materials uh, that uh, should uh, replace the lead uh, containing perovskite uh, uh, in the photo uh, detector devices. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, it seems that I have a technical problem with uh, the presentation. So is it possible to, to ask for, for technical support. I have sent my video presentation to the organizers. Is it possible to stop sharing the screen and start from your site? Sure, sure. Just a moment. Sorry. Presentation with sound. Dear participants, my name is Maria Alexandra from the Department of Microelectronics, Technical University of Sofia, Bulgaria, and I will present you our work study of hybrid infrared detectors with perovskite films and quantum dots, which is joined with colleagues from the departments of physics at Pune University in India. The aim of our work is to prepare a low-dimensional tin-based perovskite called Quasi 2D intended to replace the lead containing perovskite in the photodetector devices, then to achieve detecting ability in the near infrared range by inserting appropriate quantum dots to the lead free perovskite, and finally to measure the basic characteristics and parameters for two different electrode designs, a strip and comb shaped electrodes. On this slide you see photographs of the samples with the comp and strip shaped electrodes as well as the measurement setup with the non-back reflective tube including movable platform where the infrared light emitting diode is mounted and uh, the sample under test is located. For the samples fabrication are given the details about the involved materials and processes. As expected, the layer absorbs strongly the wavelengths near the end of the visible range and uh, uh, the near infrared range, but the absorption is more stable below the 1000 nanometer wavelength. The scanning electron microscopic image shows uniformly distributed uh, coexisted crystallites of perovskites and quantum dots with a smaller size. The device with the strip electrodes showed the linear voltage response at 860 nanometers and strong measured signal considering the small detecting area and the weak illumination power. The photo voltage decreased three times with increasing the illumination angle to 30 degrees, indicating for strong uh, space distribution sensitivity of the optical power. 
The same samples show a similar trend of the characteristics for the longer wavelength of 940 nanometers, but uh, lower voltage and current were measured, which means lower sensitivity, although the linearity is the same. The samples with the comp electrode show a greater voltage at uh, 860 nanometers than the samples with the strip electrodes, but weaker sensitivity to the light intensity variations, which is not favorable for sensing applications. The characteristics are sti still unstable for higher viewing angle, no matter of the wavelength. The response of the device with comp electrodes at 940 nanometers is the highest, but the response is uh, rather non-linear. For the device, it shows its better performance in terms of, of uh, linearity. This is the strip electrodes. It was calculated the responsivity, detectivity, and external quantum efficiency, as well as uh, the response time. Um, founding uh, symmetric rise and fall edge of the photovoltage and uh, rather acceptable uh, reaction times of 1.3 microseconds. As a conclusion, um, the device with strip electrodes exhibited more favorable uh, linearly voltage responses, they are more sensitive to 860 nanometers and they are strongly dependent on the angle of illumination. Potential application of such devices could be near-infrared microscopy, food testing, non-invasive assessment of tissue hemodynamics and other static imaging. Thank you for your attention. For further questions, don't hesitate to write me on the email. Thank you very much. Nice presentation. Thank you very much for the technical support and uh, I apologize again. No, it's fine. So if anybody has a question, please pass through the author or you can write here, here in the chat box. So we move to the next poster. Next poster will be presented by KKS Trifon on the synthesis of innovative ketosan based functional absorbents their characterizations and applications in the environmental remediation. Whether KKS is there or not, I don't think the presenter is there. So we have to put again the presentation. Hello, my name is Rifin Gekes, a PhD student in the School of Chemical Engineering in the National Technical University of Athens. And I am very excited to present you today our joint research with University Laval entitled Synthesis of Innovative Ketosome Based Functional Composite Materials for Adsorbents, Materials Characterization and Application in Environmental Remediation. Water contamination is a global problem that needs to be addressed in order to render water safe for humans. Ketosome, a non toxic and environment friendly material, possesses functional hydroxyl and amino groups that grant it exceptional adsorptive abilities. Thus, ketosome based adsorbents are widely studied as efficient adsorbing agents. Beta cyclodextrin is a low cost and biocompatible cyclic de derivative of STAR with functional hydroxyl groups in its structure, which make it an appealing adsorbent. Cerium oxide is an abundant rare earth metal oxide with exceptional physical and chemical properties that is currently being studied as an alternative adsorbent agent. Therefore, the coupling of ketosan with beta cyclodextrin or serum oxide for the synthesis of novel absorbing agents can be proved as an efficient and viable solution in the field of water purification via adsorption. The aim of our study was to synthesize two functional absorbing agents by coupling ketosan with beta cyclodextrin and serum oxide and characterize them by means of FIR, SEM, and XRD analysis. Moreover, their efficiency towards the adsorption of hexavalent chromine and indigo carmine was evaluated by a performing batch experiment. According to the FTIR analysis, both adsorbents presented characteristic peaks of primary amines of the bonds between carbon and hydrogen and of the bonds between carbon and nitrogen, but in slightly different wave numbers. The efficient synthesis of the adsorbent was verified by the presence of the characteristic peak of serum oxide for the ketosan serum oxide adsorbent and by the characteristic peak of sodium trypolyphosphate for the ketosan beta cyclodextrin 1. Same analysis of the ketosan beta cyclodextrin adsorbent indicated typically rough and wrinkled polymeric network with irregular pores, which enabled the adsorption of the studied contaminants. On the other hand, the surface of the ketosan serum oxide adsorbent 
is racked with multiple cavities in which ions of intercocar mine and hexavalent chromium can be attached. The major peaks presented by the XRD analysis at numerous degrees for the hydrogen serum oxide adsorbent indicated the polycrystalline structure of the synthesized adsorbent. Results derived by the adsorption experiments indicated that at optimum operating conditions, both adsorbents were able to efficiently adsorb the solid contaminants. To conclude with our work, two novel adsorbent agents were synthesized by coupling ketosan with beta-cyclodextrin and serum oxide. FIAR, same and XRD analysis verified the coupling of the materials and indicated their adsorption abilities. Finally, both adsorbents exhibited high efficacy in the adsorption of hexavalent chromium and nicocarmine. Thank you very much for your attention. Hello, my name is Rifun Gekin. Okay. If anybody has any question, please write. We'll pass through the author or presenter. So our next presenter will be Maxine Misnem. And title will be the effect of prolonged exposure to elevated temperature on the deformability and relaxation of some thermosetting polymer binders. Yeah, Maxim, please go ahead. Good evening, dear colleagues. Can you hear me? Hello. Yes, we can. Yeah. Okay. You share your screen. Do you see the presentation? Okay. Yes, you can see it. Doing, you have to share the presentation. Now we can. I, we cannot see your presentation. You have to share the screen. Mm Hmm. Now? Yes. Go ahead. Yes. Okay. Can I start? Yeah, sure. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, good evening, dear colleagues. My name is Maxim Mishnev. I'm presenting a report on the effect of prolonged exposure to elevated temperatures on the deformability and the relaxation. Uh, <clears throat> of the structure of some thermosetting polymer binders. This work is devoted to the study on the effect of uh, relatively prolonged exposure to elevated temperatures on the change in the deformability of some thermosetting polymer binders, which used uh, to the manufacture of composite building structures, such as fiberglass shells, of chimneys and gas ducts of industrial enterprises. Such structures during operation are exposed to long-term combined action of mechanical loads and elevated temperatures. Examples of such constructions are shown on the slide. The main objectives of the study were to assess the effect of prolonged exposure to elevated temperatures on the weight loss of binders and very stiffness characteristics. The following type of thermosetting binders were considered. Epoxy resin with anhydride hardener, phenolic formaldehyde resin of a result type, epoxy phenolic resin. All polymer binders uh, were cured at elevated temperatures. Binder composition and curing models are shown on the slide. After curing, beam specimens were cut from the obtained plates. The following methods were used in the work, thermogravimetric method, dynamic mechanical analysis, static three-point bending at room and elevated temperatures. The equipment used is shown on the slide. Uh, in thermogravimetric analysis, weight loss and heat uh, release were determined under short-term exposure to high to high temp temperatures. Dynamic mechanical analysis determined the glass transition temperature of the binders before and after prolonged uh, exposure at elevated temperatures. At static three point bending, uh, the modulus of elasticity was determined uh, cold. We mean the modulus determined at room temperature, hot at increased. 
temperature. Samples of cured binders were kept for a long time in the laboratory oven at elevated temperatures. From time to, from time, to time, they, they were gradually cooled, removed, weighed, uh, the loss of mass was recorded, and the cold modulus of elasticity in bending was measured. The results, the results of thermogravimetric analysis are shown here. According to them, the national temperature of long-term holding was taken as a possible point of the onset of intense thermal relaxation or changes in the structure under the influence of temperature. Uh, here shown the results uh, of a study of weight loss during long-term holding at temperature of 160, 190, and 220 degrees. It was determined that uh, the nature of the mass loss was uh, mainly decaying. The weight loss was associated not with thermal destruction, but with the escape from the samples of uh, more volatile components that filled the inter-domain inter space. The glass transition temperature before and after aging was determined by dynamic mechanical analysis. Uh, it was found that the epoxy binder after aging, it, it increased by 30 and for the epoxy phenolic binder by 75 persons. Here shown the results of determining the dependence of the elastic modules of binders from elevated temperature to long-term exposure at elevated temperatures. On the slides 11, 12, and 13 show the changes in the hot elastic model of considered binders after holding at elevated temperatures. For example, for an epoxy binder, the modulus at 110 degrees was doubled. Uh, for epoxy phenolic, it uh, increased at seven times at 100 degrees. Uh, and for phenolic binder, it increased three times. At the same time, this slide shows that cold modulus did not change significantly after exposure except for the phenolic binder, which during aging at uh, 220 degrees, showed a sharp decrease, apparently due to sharp changes in the structure. Uh, and uh, here shown the main conclusions. With prolonged exposure at elevated temperature, the considered binders, there is a gradual loss of weight which is decaying at temperatures up to uh, 119 degrees. Uh, the mass loss is presumably not related to thermal destruction, but cost uh, the escape of lighter volatile components from interdomain space. According to DMA analysis, after prolonged exposure at elevated temperature, the glass transition temperature in the considered binders increased by 30 to 75 percent. The most interesting result, uh, we think uh, that after exposure, the cold modulus of elasticity did not change and the hot modulus increased very significantly. Thus, this can be basis for the increasing the rigidity of composites operating at elevated temperature. The work is carried out at the expense of a grant from Russian Foundation for Basic Research. Uh, thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much for the presentation. So we are passing uh, Bit late, we are running a little bit really late. Let us pass to the next presenter. Next presenter will be Yano Jun, it's from Japan.
the uh, title is time depending time de displaying film composed of poly or some polymer and common transparent polymer films uh, is poster number 11 uh, i don't know whether presenter is there or not i don't think presenter is there so yeah it's probably there. it's midnight in japan yeah that's the problem my name is Salahdin Bogofa. I'm going to present a short presentation under the title towards. This one? Wait. This one is not. Oh, not this one. It's 11, right? Oh, I know. The 11 one, we do not yeah. have a video, video version. We just have a poster. Yeah, Maybe just have a poster. Maybe we should skip this one? Yeah, sure. We can see. So next one will be presented by Monish Chatterjee towards highly efficient solar cell design using a chiral lens. And Monish uh, is Monish there? I don't think Monish is there. So we have to. I will skip this presentation or we can, we can present if number 12. Present, remember, yeah. my name is Salahdin Bogofa. I'm going to present a short presentation under the title Towards High Efficient Solar Cell Design Using Dispersive Carrel Lens. So, we'll talk about the transmission of the sunlight across the carrel uh, dispersive uh, thick lens is examined via deriving the ABC matrix. And the first order dispersive via the dielectric permittivity is considered in this research. A special line with via spectrum analysis around each a carrier frequency of each color that will represent the sideband frequency cap omega that used in the dispersive model. And then we're going to show a special separation in the YZ plane of the RGB colors. Examples of 2D image propagation across uh, this type of lens also will be presented. And the idea of uh, the color separation spectrum will be used uh, toward improve the solar cell efficiency, which is characterized by the open circuit current, uh, short circuit current, sorry, and the open circuit voltage field factor and the conversion uh, efficiency. All these parameters will be examined via special separation of the color spectrum. This is an example of uh, color location of the rainbow transparency passing through the dispersive color thick lens. So incoherent white light, once it's passing through the dispersive uh, lens, will be decomposed to the special colors, and each color will have a unique focal length, and of course, will has, uh, therefore, will has a unique location. So this one is when the, the, this plot uh, plot A represents the when the medium inside the, the lens being dispersive and the uh, plot B when the medium inside the thick lens being chiral and dispersive. That's why we have uh, uh, LCB and RCB with the right and left uh, uh, circuit polarization. This is the system configuration that uses it to improve the solar cell performance. So this is the, uh, so each color will, uh, will has a unique um, uh, image plane in YZ plane. So the, the, the prism here just represents the wavelength of the source, which is a sunlight. So by, by placing uh, the different type of solar cell of uh, solar junction in the YZ plane uh, will be uh, intercept each focusing color, its focused color uh, along YZ. Each cell will be observed a single wavelength and hence will likely operate more efficiency and the multicolor uh, uh, multi multi cell configuration will might be utilized whole uh, the solar spectrum this is an example of 2d image propagation across the uh, propagating across the uh, uh, dispersive lens so this is the input image and this is the image uh, reconstructed image after passing uh, through the dispersive lens as we mentioned each pixel in the individual Color of the input transmission will has uh, in the input color uh, will have uh, image. It will has a unique focal length. Therefore, it will has a unique location. This is a radiation profile of individual wavelength that will use to uh, compute uh, the efficiency of each solar cell that will place it or that will observe a specific uh, wavelength. 
in the YZ plane, of course. So this is the models of the equation that will be used uh, to compute uh, the efficiency of each individual, uh, each cell that place it in the YZ plane. And this is some references that used in this research. Thank you so much for your uh, listening. Okay, thank you. We, we pass to the next poster. Next poster is given, will be presented by, okay, it will not be presented. He was here, he told, wrote me. Name is Orion Sipja. B or C, I don't know, uh, is, is the session chair in other session. So we have to run this session, run this poster, okay, display. But he sent right. me a new, new poster. Remember, he modified the poster a little bit, presentation. He sent me a couple of hours ago, new one. Whether you have the new poster, new pre presentation or not? I don't know if this is a new one or not. Uh, it's, it's a video. Do we just play this video? Yeah. Let me see. Let me, Let me see. see. Let me check. I am Hello, not... everybody. Wait a minute. The main problem is that somebody you cannot. Let me share the screen first. Is this the is this the latest one? Can you see my screen? Wait a minute. Can you hear? This poster we explain some of our findings concerning the behavior of two-dimensional systems of electrons, and in particular, two-dimensional quantum of clusters of electrons with anisotropic features. Low-dimensional nanosystems, as well as two-dimensional materials, are of great interest to many scientific disciplines and may have a lot of applications in fields such as Okay, so our next uh, next presentation will be presentation uh, poster nineteen will be presented by Yunbam Park. I don't know whether he is there or not. The, uh, the title, yes. Ah, good. Um, hello. Hello. Uh, I'm going to present instead uh, Professor Jun Bumbak. Actually, I'm a student of Professor Jun Bumbak. So okay. let me share my sure. uh, poster. <clears throat> so 
Mm, can you see my poster or? Yes, sure. Yes, we are seeing. Uh, okay, let me start. Um, uh, hello, everybody. I am Rahim from Seoul National University from Korea. Uh, the title of my poster is Heavy Metal Removal by Using uh, Tire Drive Activated Carbon. So uh, as everybody knows, actually, uh, soil and groundwater in industrial zone are so vulnerable to be contaminated with various kinds of inorganic and organic contaminants. Uh, also, we have this big issue in South Korea, and based on some survey, we found uh, some inorganic contaminants are really distributed in industrial zone. So we have to find some treatment method for preventing what, of spreading this kind of contaminant inside the groundwater. Stabilization is kind of process, which in this process, some kind of sorbent are adding to the soil, and then they will bind and catch this kind of contaminants. And then finally, they will prevent the spreading of contaminants from soil to the groundwater. So as you can see, there are some most common absorbent which can be used for stabilization, but these kind of sorbent are mostly uh, expensive and using them uh, for large scale is not so cost effective. So we have to find some sorbent which, is, uh, which has good efficiency and at the same time is uh, so cost effective. So at this study, we tried to use some, uh, we tried to make some activated carbon from waste tire. And first of all, we made some pulverized waste tire and based on this chart by using some to furnace in lab and having some chemical activation, we try to make uh, activated carbon from tire. And then at the next step, we perform some sorption test for both uh, tire activated carbon and commercial activated carbon for some uh, heavy metal. And as you can see here, this, this slide shows the result for uh, sorption test. And for each examined heavy metal, we found uh, TAC or tire activated carbon has more efficiency and absorption capacity comparing to the uh, commercial activated carbon. Also, we perform uh, kinetic sorption tests at different mm, times, and then we found the absorption of heavy metal by tire activated carbon is faster than commercial activated carbon, and uh, tire activated carbon is saturating faster than commercial activated carbon. And here you can see the short conclusion. Uh, as I told already, the tire activated carbon showed the higher absorption capacity almost eight times comparing to the uh, commercial activated carbon. And the absorption sequence was first PV, second copper, and finally zinc. And also based on kinetic sorption, TAC or tire activated carbon uh, showed faster absorption comparing to the commercial activated carbon. Uh, that was my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for the presentation. Nice. And if anybody has any any questions, please write down here or directly you can communicate to the presenter. We have the email in the in the presentation at the bottom of the list of the presentations. So our next topic or next speaker will be Victor Genchev, Genchev Ivanov. Ivanov. Yeah. Yes. I'm here, yeah. so let me share my poster. Do you see it? So uh, I'm going to present our work, which is entitled spin lattice interactions in magnetoelectric alpha iron hydroxide, a Raman spectroscopy approach. Alpha iron hydroxide or geotite is a widely spread iron bearing mineral in the earth crust. It is collinear antiferromagnet with a high neo temperature of nearly 400 Kelvin. Recently, it was demonstrated that the compound is a magnetoelectric material with a strong linear magnetoelectric coupling coefficient. The aim of our study was to go further and assess the interaction between the magnetic ordering and the lattice degrees of freedom of the compound. 
our main experimental method was Raman spectroscopy, since Raman actifonus are very sensitive to different kinds of phase transitions, structural, magnetic, electronic, etc. We made use of three different excitation wavelengths and performed our Raman measurements in a temperature range between 250 and 500 K, which covers the nail temperature of the compound. We interpreted the experimental results with DFT lattice dynamics calculations by making use of PB plus U functional. Our Raman measurements revealed that the phonon modes overlay a broad scattering background with a maximum corresponding strictly to the strongest exchange interaction constant in iron, oxygen one iron super exchange path. The B symmetry phonons display a pronounced phenotype asymmetry, which implies that the corresponding atomic displacement are strongly coupled to the excitations from the background. The asymmetry parameter is temperature, in, uh, is temperature dependent with strongest slope around the nail temperature. This fact led us to the conclusion that the scattering background stems from white assisted singlet triplet transition in the iron oxygen one iron dimers. Linear and quadratic spin lattice interaction coefficients were estimated based on DFT calculations and the quantum chemical dimer approach and are consistent with observed phonon line asymmetry and frequency shifts around the nail temperature. Their values are comparable to those in other transition metal oxides displaying multiferroic behavior. In conclusion, our work demonstrates that apart from magnetoelectric properties, alpha iron hydroxide possesses additional functionality resulting from spin lattice coupling. Thus, we qualify this compound as a promising material for magnetomechanical applications. So that was my presenta short presentation. Thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact me by my email. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for the presentation. So we'll move to the next presentation. Next presentation will be uh, presentation number 16. It is it will be presented by Danny Manuel Clavo Calvo Velasco from Colombia. It's on optical properties of one dimensional graded photonic crystals considering linear and quadratic profiles. Is Danny there? Yeah. Yeah, it's there. Yeah, there. We can see. We cannot hear. Maybe microphone is off. Hi, nice to meet you. My name is Dani Manuel Calvo, and I want to present this work with the title of Directional Photonic Band Gaps in One Dimensional Gravity Photonic Crystal Considering Linear and Quadratic in this Profile. We use the transfer matrix formalism for the calculation of the transmittance of the systems, and the system is made with uh, electric slab and slab with gradative index profile that is simulated with the use of a multiple set of the electric slab with constant refractive index. Uh, we keep constant this value that is the average value for the gradative index profile for all the different profile that we study. The linear and the quadratic profile are related with the F parameter and this parameter is, is also related with the slope for the linear profile and for the curvature for the quadratic one. Uh, we observe here different values of S and of F and also different values for the relative index profile. 
the linear case will observe the formation of new photonic band gaps with the increase of F. Uh, and these band gaps uh, keep constant, well, almost keep constant their uh, central frequency. But for the quadratic one, we observe also the formation of new photonic band gaps. But here the central frequency is shifted to lower lower values of the frequency, a uh, red shift for the central frequency. Also, we observe for the third transmission band that they decrease its transmission values with decrease of the curvature. In the uh, uh, oh, in the obliqua case, uh, oblique case for the incidence, we observe the formation of omnidirectional photonic band gaps for the linear and quadratic case, but uh, in the quadratic case we observe that this kind of omnidirectional photonic band gaps are uh, increasing number with the augment of the F parameter. Here, we present the shape of these omnidirectional photonic band gaps with the F parameter, and for central values of F, we have three omnidirectional photonic band gaps for the quadratic case. These are our conclusions. Thanks for your time. Hi, nice. Okay, so our next presentation will be given by Shingo Bae from Korea. Okay, I believe so. Okay, so it will be on laser written flexible touch pressure sensor based on polymide substrate. Yeah, can I share the? See, please go ahead. Thank you for giving the interest to my research and let you know about laser and use process and its applications. Now we can see in here, see how we synthesize and form the glass carbon on Kapton polyimide film. Laser process to remove atoms such as hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen in polyimide. Only carbon is remaining and become glass carbon that's shown in XRD analysis result compared with, <coughs> sorry, polyimide. So Raman spectroscopy shows the peaks that doesn't appear in Raman spectroscopy of graphene that's showing in jet directional bond of glass carbon. It is a little bit important thing because it showing addition with the substrate and glass carbon electrode. So how can we make the optimization? There are several factors of laser, like power, frequency, and scan speed. Without considerate optimization, laser-induced carbonization could make only graphite that exhibit in low electrical property. Besides, only focus on conductivity, results graphene structural carbon removed, jet directional bond, and addition is removed, and it is a little bit critical error. So we want to take both of property with the electrical property for conductivity and mechanical property for addition and stability. Here you can check the process, how we can reach the optimization for laser induced glass carbon. Electro electrodes were ready, so now we try to make the laser induced glass carbon, touch pressure sensor. It shows conductivity increase with the pressing in here, with pressing through the connection of the carbon nanoparticles at 0 0.01 volt biases. Low power consumption can reach, but this touch pressure sensor has indicate limits of application because of too high conductivity. High conductivity decreases the sensitivity and stability of the 
cost pressure detection. So now we try to trade off the conductivity and mechanical property for best sensor electrode with low cost time saving of the carbon sensor application. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you for the presentation. If anybody has a question or something, or discussion, if you want to discuss, please write the author through this, through this email provided in the poster. So we pass to the next presentation, will be presented, supposed to be presented by Abdullah Kim El Sabi. If Abdullah Kim is there, it is on gene cannot based electrochromic devices devices no it's a poster 18 can you please run this poster please yeah hello everyone my name is Wu Zhang I'm a doctoral student in Dr. Abdul Hakam Al Azabi's research group. Today, I'm going to introduce zinc anode based electrochrome devices. Here is an outline of the topics. Firstly, I'm going to give some background information of electrochrome devices and the motivation to introduce zinc anode based electrochrome devices. After that, I'm going to explain what's the meaning of zinc anode and the electrochrome devices, how to get improved. Uh, this is following by three examples based on zinc anode based electrochrome devices. Finally, I'm going to give a conclusion. So what are electrochrome devices? Basically, an electrochromic device can reversibly change its optical states under applied voltages, as shown in, shown in the left figure. This kind of electrochrome device, also known as a smart window, can reversibly change between bright, cool, and the dark states. On the right side, it shows how the applied voltage switching leads to different transmittances of the smart window. By switching the different applied voltages, we can obtain different optical states of the electrochromic devices. So what's the basic mechanism of the electrochrome devices? The image on the top shows a conventional electrochromic device. Conventional electrochromic devices consist of a substrate a conducting layer, ion storage layer, electrolyte, and the electrochrome layer. The image on the bottom shows the working principle of this kind of device. Under different, different applied voltages, the ions in the electrolytes are switched between the ion storage layer and the, the electrochrome layer. In this way, the electrochrome device shows a coloration process and a decoloration process. This is the basic mechanism of conventional electrochrome devices. However, the operation of conventional electrochrome devices require applied voltages in both coloration and the decoloration processes. This is not an energy efficient technology. So how to reduce the power supply? We introduce zinc anode based electrochromic devices. Here is a demonstration comparing the conventional electrochrome devices and the zinc anode based electrochrome devices shown on the left side. Left side, conventional electrochrome devices possess one piece of ion storage layer and one piece of electrochrome layer. However, for zinc anode based electrochrome devices, we replace the ion storage layer with another electrochrome layer was shown on the right side. And we also insert a piece of zinc foil between the two electrochrome layers. So what's going to happen for this stru stru structure? We are going to have a new working principle. For conventional electrochrome devices, as shown in the top image, ions are switched between the, uh, the ion storage layer and the electrochrome layer. However, for zinc 
anode-based electrical current devices was shown in the bottom image. The redux potential differences between the zinc anode and the electrical current layer provides a driving force that activates the oxidation of zinc and the redu reduction of the electrical current layer. This means we can achieve a self-coloration process through powering external electronics. And uh, we can also bleach the electrical current layer under uh, ex uh, external applied voltages. In this zinc-based device structure, only one process consumes energy. But for the conventional electrical current devices, energy are, con are consumed in both coloration and the decoloration processes. Also, the energy provided to power the external electronics enable partially retrieved energy consumed in bleaching process. That's how the energy retrieval function works. Next, I'm going to show three examples of zinc-based electrochromic devices. The first example is high-performance smart window enabled by zinc-based electrochromic devices. As shown in figure A, a piece of zinc foil was sandwiched between two tungsten oxide electrodes. The redux potential differences between the zinc anode and the tungsten oxide electrochromic layer provides a 1.1 volt open circuit potential shown in figure B. Sure, uh, this open circuit potential enables the self-coloration process through lighting and LED shown in figure C. So this zinc anode-based electrochromic devices can power the external electronics, electronics and at the same time change its color. Also, we have two electrochrome layers. This is distinguished to one electrochrome layer of conventional electrochrome devices. In this way, this zinc-based electrochrome device processes 77 optical contrast. This is the highest reported optic contrast to date. Mm. Next example is transparent multicolor displays enabled by zinc anode based electrochromic devices. In this device, we introduced an electrochromic material called SVO. A single SVO electrode can switch between orange, yellow, and green color states. Shown in figure A, this zinc-based electrochromic device was assembled by sandwiching a piece of zinc, fo zinc foil between two SVO electrodes. Since we have a zinc foil between the two electrodes, the top and the bottom electrodes can operate independently. So the color overlay strategy was introduced as shown in figure B. For example, the number four, the orange color on top and the green color on the bottom, a brown color. A brown color can be generated through the color overlay. In this way, since a single SVO electrode can switch between three different colors, the device can switch between six distinct colors. Showing you Fig F. <clears throat> this device also possesses a high transmittance as shown in Figure C. And also because of the redux potential differences between the zinc anode and the SVO electrochromic layer, this device can self-colorize by lighting an LED showing in figure D and E. The last example is solar charging smart windows enabled by zinc anode-based electrochromic devices. We cannot connect a solar cell with an electrochromic layer uh, device. As shown in figure A, the solar cell can power the zinc-based electrochrome devices during the daytime, and this device can power external electro electronics at night. Figure C shows a prototype device of the solar charging smart window. And the figure D demonstrates the optical contrast at daytime and at night. So for the whole smart window system, no external power is required and the system can also power external electronics. More interesting, in figure B, we also introduce a transparent zinc mesh. Zinc mesh. This zinc mesh possesses high optical transmittance around 90%. The conclusion. 
In this presentation, we introduce the zinc anode-based electrochromic devices. Compared to conventional electrochromic devices, zinc anode-based electrochromic devices can eliminate the voltage requirement for the coloration process and enable partial retrieval of the electric energy consumed during the bleaching process. It also enables the independent operation of the top and the bottom electrodes, thus providing a strategy of color overlay. The device can also be connected with a solar cell to form a solar charge smart window system. This window system can be colorated. Okay, you have to turn off this presentation. It's too long, 10 minutes long, but we have already run eight minutes. So we pass to the next presentation as we are passing, uh, running late. <clears throat> next presentation will be presented by Jay Baha. I think she is there. Yes, sir. I am here. Okay. Sir, I hope my uh, slide is visible now. Yeah, yeah, it's visible. Oh, uh, yeah. Right. Uh, hello, everyone. Today I am here to present my poster entitled Lead Substitution in European Bismuth Sulfur Fluoride, a Superconductor to Insulated Transition. A brief introduction about the bismuth based systems. Superconductivity in these systems were first of all discovered in the year 2012 in BI404S3 and later than in fluorine substituted LaOBIS2. So we see that both of these compounds, these have layered tetragonal structure where uh, the conducting BIS2 bilayers, these alternates with the blocking layer. And here the BIS2 bilayer, uh, it forms square pyramid, which has a rock salt type of uh, structure. Now an important class, of uh, uh, compounds in BIS2 based superconductors is European based. The first one is EUF BIS2. Here we see that the conducting BIS2 bilayers, they alternate with the EU2 F2 blocking layers. Now, if we add one mole of EU F2 in two moles of EUF BIS2, we get another layered tetragonal structure, which has a formula E3 Bi2 S4 F4. A notable feature about these two European compounds is that both of these are intrinsic superconductors with TC 0.3 Kelvin and 1.5 Kelvin. And superconductivity uh, in these two compounds is attributed due to European valence fluctuations. So in the present system, what we have tried is we have tried to substitute lead at bismuth sites with these compositions varying from 0.25 to 1 uh, in uh, EU3 Bi2 S4 F4. The reaction methodology that has been used in uh, the present uh, system is a uh, solid state sealed reaction tube method. In the first step, we have synthesized the precursors. And in the second step, all the reactants, they were ground together and then centered into circular disks and uh, then evacuated in sealed quartz tube method, which was uh, then centered at the desirable temperature. Uh, to characterize uh, these compounds, we have carried out powder X-ray diffraction pattern. And uh, uh, here we can see that all the reflections could be very well indexed according to tetragonal I4 by tetragonal uh, unit cell, uh, which corresponds to I4 by MMM space group. And uh, this plot shows uh, shrinkage in lattice cell volume, uh, uh, which is due to lead substitution in the system. Now, to calculate the compositional analysis of the compounds, we have carried out SEM EDAX. Uh, to calculate this uh, exact stoichiometry and the calculated molar to uh, molar bismuth to lead ratio in all the samples was very close to the nominal value within the accuracy of the measurement. We have then carried out the resistivity measurement for X is equals to 0.25 sample in the temperature range 300 to 50 Kelvin. The normal state resistivity of the compound, it corresponds to a semi-metal which increases abruptly below 50 Kelvin. So we can conclude that lead as small as 0.25 Kelvin is able to make a transition, drastic transition from superconductivity to insulator. Uh, then we have also carried out the magnetization studies on all these four compositions. Uh, for X is equals to 0.25 sample, we see a paramagnetic behavior from two to 300 Kelvin and the paramagnetic moment calculated is found to be 6.7 Bohr magneton per European atom per formula unit. And the inset here shows antiferromagnetic ordering corresponding to the Euro European spins at 2.3 Kelvin. For all the other higher doped uh, lead samples, we found 
uh, paramagnetic similar pa paramagnetic behavior with their magnetic moment ranging from 0. Point, plus minus 0. 0.2 to 0. 0.5 bohr magneton per europium atom so here i conclude my studies uh, by saying that we have successfully synthesized lead substituted sample which was reflected by uh, decrease in the lattice volume shrinkage in the lattice volume and also reflected by scm adax and uh, magnetic measurements uh, it suggests the presence of mixed valence state of the europium due to the change or fluctuation in the europium moment and lead as small as 12.5% at bismuth sites in eu 3 bi 2 s 4 f 4 it could destroy superconductivity and we found a superconductor to insulator phase transition in the present system. I'd like to acknowledge our funding agencies uh, for pursuing this research. And these are the references which I have used to present the work. Finally, I thank organizers for giving me this opportunity. I'll be happy to receive any queries on this poster. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you, sir. Anybody, anybody has, I have a particular question, but I'll write you later. So, uh, sure, sir. I'll be very happy to uh, answer it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So we pass to the next presentation. Okay, it will be presented by Da Chen Chen from Taiwan. It's on fabrication of uniform green peroxide light emitting diodes for sandwich evaporation technique. Fabrication of uniform green perovskite light emitting diode via sandwich evaporation technique. Perovskite light emitting diodes are, have recently attracted great attention due to their narrow emission and high color purity. Differing from the current thin film perovskite forming method, as you can see from the picture below, in this experiment, MAPBBR3 thin film were started with commercially available ITO glasses as the substrates, which were ultrasonically cleaned sequentially by deionized water, acetone, isopropyl alcohol, and methanol for 15 minutes each. The P.PSS was filtered by 0.2 millimeter filter before use. We spin coated at 4000 RPM for 30 seconds and annealed at uh, 120 degrees Celsius for 10 minutes in ambient air. To fabricate the MAPBBR3 perovskite layer, MABR was spin coated as the first layer of the sandwich deposition method, and then used an evaporator to deposit it, uh, uh, PBBR2 as the second layer, and finally used a self-made chamber to evaporate MABR as the last layer. After completing the MAPBBR3 crystalline film, TPBI was spin coated at uh, 2000 RPM for 45 seconds in nitrogen glove box. LIF and silver were deposited successfully by the thermal evaporation method. Finally, the device were packaged uh, by enclosing the cover glass in a nitrogen glove box. The SEM image of the cross section is shown in figure 2A. The thickness of MAPBBR3 is 213 uh, nanometer. Figure 1B shows that the grand size of crystalline MAPBBR3 is about 300 nanometer. By using SDT, it is possible to produce well crystallined, flat, and uniform perovskite thin film with narrow full width and half maximum photoluminance spectrum under blue light stimulation. As shown in figure 1b and e, the optimal perovskite LED gave the maximum luminance of about 392 cd per meter squared, uh, the maximum current efficiency of about uh, 0.046 cd per ampere, and the maximum external quantum efficiency of about 0.108%. Fabrication of Okay, so we will pass to the next presentation. It will be present, presented by Hui Huang, uh, Hui Hong Sen. Uh, it's on perovskite layer, hypergonvent perovskite solar cell 
in sandwich evaporation technique they fabricated so i don't know whether present time is there or not it's also from taiwan so we have to run the poster number hello everyone Thank you for your participation. I'm a master student from National Taiwan University, and my name is Hui Hongshen. Next, I will start my report. The title of my report is Optimization of the MAPBIX CL3-X Purple Sky Layer in a High Performance Purple Sky Solar Cell by a Sandwich Evaporation Technique. Differing from the current thin film perforate sky forming method, we developed a handmade chamber to fabricate the perforate sky layer by a sandwich evaporation technique. It's called SET process. As shown in this picture, this chamber is our self-made chamber. This picture is a schematic diagram of our SET chamber. This process is begin by first spin coating PWPSS on ITO glass substrate. After spin coating PWPSS, we spin coating CH3NH3I. It's called MAI. We spin coating MAI on PWPSS. After that, we use thermal evaporation to deposit lead chloride on MAI. Then, MAI is evaporated at a low pressure by SCT chamber. This device saves a lot of time in the pump down phase and opens up the ability to form large purple sky grains in comparison to traditional solution methods. Through the SCT process, double, double interdiffusion allow more completely crystal to form. The crystalline film of MAPVIX CL3-X can be produced within 35 minutes. We can see the SEM image in figure 1. The surface SEM image of MAPVIX CL3-X film after different time of SCT process Perforate gas thin film is fabricated for 15 minutes, 25 minutes, 35 minutes, and 45 minutes. We can see that better perforate gas crystal can be obtained at 35 minutes. Figure 2, we can see that in 35 minutes, the perforate sky spectral absorption efficiency in the visible light range can reach about 80%. So the conclusion is the SCT process with different time would promote the lead chloride to react with MAI. In particular, 35 minute could obtain, obtain the best preferred sky thin film. Moreover, with the SCT evaporation times increase, lead chloride react with MAI better. In 35 minutes, the better Perforate sky crystal can be formed, and the spectral absorption efficiency can up to 80%. Thank you for your attention. Hello, everyone. Thank you for. Okay. As we pass to the poster number 22, which will be presented by Han Wu. Han Yu Sai and poster is on add polyvinyl butyl to make high efficiency rare earth fluorescent materials. So that the speaker or presenter is there or not, I don't think is there. So we have to run the poster again. Number 22, please. everyone. Thank you all for being here. 
My name is Cai Han Yu. I'm a National Taiwan University student. Now I'm going to start my report. The title is Add Polyvinyl Butera to Make High Efficiency Real as Free Fluorescent Materials. The abstract is now that the subpixel size of display has reached the micro level. However, micro LED display cannot be easily mass produced due to the challenge of mass transfer. In this study, polyvinyl butera was used with organic dyes to form a colloidal solution. By adding a specific proportion of polymer, a fluorescent film with a quantum yield of more than 85%. Can be prepared to meet the thickness of the micro LED for the color conversion luminescent layer. The fluorescent dye used in our lab are real as element free fluorescent materials, so this technology will not pollute the global environment. Next is introduction. The first one is the properties of PVB give the fluorescent film. The fluorescent film has good resistance water, oxygen, acid, and alkaline. So the array can not only be fabricated outside the glow box, but also resist the developer. And the film exhi exhibits extremely high conversion efficiency. The second one is innovative spin coating method instead of thermal evaporation deposition method. Conventionally, organic luminescent Molecular films are produced by thermal evaporation, deposition method in this case. We use spin coating method is not only conducive to large scale production but also beneficial for less waste of many materials. The experimental method. We mix the solvents, the fluorescent dye, and the polymer PVB to make the fluorescent solution, and use the spin coater and copper to form the fluorescent film. Then, by using the integrating sphere with a 460 nanometer blue LED to measure the excitation spectra and the quantum yield of the fluorescent film. The results and discu discussion. We use the fluorescence dye DCJTB C454T and PO01TB to make the high quantum yield red, green, and yellow fluorescence film. Table 1 is about emission range, peak light emission, and quantum yield in different fluorescence film. I will use figure 1. Film emission spectra of the different fluorescence dye to explain the parameter for, from the table one. The first one is the DCJTB fluorescence film. It's red nine. Its emission range is six hundred to seven hundred sixteen nanometer. Peak light is six hundred thirty four nanometer. Quantum yield is eighty six point eight percent. The second one is C four five forty fluorescence film. It's green line. Its emission range is four hundred eighty to seven hundred nanometer. Peak light emission is five hundred thirty nine nanometer. Quantum yield is ninety point two percent. The final one is the P O zero one TV fluorescence film. It's yellow line. Its emission range is five hundred forty to seven hundred fifty. Nanometer. Peak light emission is 586 nanometer. Quantum yield is 96.5%. The conclusion is by adding a specific proportion of polymer PVB. The quantum yield of the fluorescent film is more than 85%. It can be seen from the experiment. The quantum yield of C4540 DCJTP and PO01TB fluorescent film are 90.2%, per, 90 86.8%, and 96.5%, respectively. This method results in a high brightness of micro LED chips and retains the high color 
situation of this place. It is end of my presentation. Thank you for your listening. Okay. Now I pass to the present son twenty three, post twenty three. I don't know whether Tao Hua is there. I don't think uh, he or she is here, and we do not have a video or the, the PPT is to, do not have sound, so I think we should skip this one. Yeah, we, we skip some. We skip the last one, and we pass to that 24. 24 will be presented by Iran, uh, Siri Iran Janardhana or Kunda Reddy. It will be on Garbani, the displacement, and Compositional modulation in electrochemically deposited iron, cobalt, nickel, copper, zinc, high entropy alloy thin films. Is anybody there? Kiran, Siri Kiran, or Kunda Reddy? Hello, all. No. First of all, I thank Triple FM for giving me this platform to present my work. My name is Siri Kiran Reddy and I am from IIT Hyderabad, India. My topic for today's poster presentation is Galvanic Displacement and Compositional Modulation in Electrochemically Deposited Fe, CO, Ni, CuZ and High Entropy Alloy Thin Films. Unlike conventional alloys which have a principal base element like for example iron in case of steels, high entropy alloys have 5 or more constituent elements in almost similar proportions. Galvanic displacement reactions, also known as GDR, are reactions where an element with a more positive reduction potential steals electrons from an element that has a lower reduction potential. The formation of a thin layer of copper on the surface of an iron nail when it is immersed in copper sulphate solution is an example of this. My abstract in a nutshell is that we observe these galvanic displacement reactions in case of my alloy after electrodeposition and that the same were characterized by scanning electron microscopy in X-ray diffraction studies. For experimentation, we have used an all-sulphate aqueous electrolyte made up of sulphates of iron, cobalt, nickel, copper and zinc. To initiate GDR, after completion of the electrodeposition, we held the electrodes immersed in the electrolyte for various time periods. SEM images of the as deposited or 0-minute immerse sample indicate a globular structure, whereas for the 60-minute immerse samples, we can see dendrites on top of these globules. SEM EDS mapping of one of these globules of the 60-minute sample shows that the copper concentration is seen to increase at the expense of other elements. The same can also be concluded by the SEM EDS spot analysis where the rate of decrease of zinc concentration is almost equal to the rate of increase in copper concentration during the first 10 minutes. After the 10 minutes, on account of the low concentration of zinc, the rate of increase of copper concentration is equal to the sum of the rates of decrease of iron, cobalt and nickel concentration. Since electrodeposition process is not an equilibrium process, the deposited film, especially the electrodeposited HES, don't have enough time to form a highly crystalline structure as evident from the XRD results. And the initial peaks relating to BCC HEA at approximately 44.5 degrees is seen as having a downward trend as the holding time increases. This is balanced by an increase in the XRD peak corresponding to that of copper on account of a copper film form. Zinc, which has the lowest reduction potential, is ready to give away its electrons to the copper ions from the electrolyte solution and that these copper ions undergo reduction reactions and form metallic copper on the thin film. After zinc, GDR reactions start replacing iron, cobalt, nickel from the thin films and with time their concentrations decrease. The almost similar dissolution rates of iron and cobalt in spite of their different standard redox potential can probably be due to complex formation or associated kinetics. Placing the electrode in deionized water right after electrodeposition can eliminate GDR. Though GDR reactions are unwanted reactions, they can still be employed to form ABB type multilayers where A is an alloy and B is copper respectively. With this, I concluded my talk and thank the audience for their time. Have a good day. Hello all. Pass to the, First. Pass to the next poster, poster number 20, 25. It will be presented by Bajinsky Masi from Poland, observing and controlling the crystallization process in reconfigurable plasmonic superlattice. I don't think he is there. So I think question. he is here. Is there? Uh, there's no sound. 
Hello, if I can ski. Hello. Bajinski, Mr. Bajinski, I don't think, or left, maybe. Hi, uh, if you have some technical problem, please uh, type, type what's your problem in yeah. the chat. Yeah. yeah, that can be. Do you see the presenter? Yeah, I think he's here, but. Okay, um, maybe we can uh, skip this, this presenter and play next one. Yeah, so next one will be presented by Ming Chen Wu. So it will be on inference of rapid thermal annealing time on fluorine of zinc oxide thin film deposited by RF magneton sputtering for solar, solar cell applications. I told all my presentation is influence of rapid thermal annealing time and DNO as thin films deposited by RF magneton sputtering for solar cell applications. I am Ming Chen Wu. I come from National Zhongxing University, Taiwan. My outline is introduction, experiments, results, and discussion, conclusions. Transparent conducting assays are intensively used in optometrical devices. DNO based TCO films have been widely investigated owing to its wide direct band gap, abandoned raw material, and no toxicity. However, its conductivity is lower than ITO film. The end of its work is improve its optoelectrical properties through fuel doping and RTA. FDO thin films were deposited by IF Mectron sputtering from a DNO target means with 3 more percent near F2. RTA was carried out at 300 degrees C. And the nail in tides is from 0 to 120 seconds in vacuum. This is SRD patterns. SRD pattern shows and peak at 2 theta, 34.4 degree, which suggests a high singular world size structure with show all two crystal organization. Peak intensity increase with RTA time. Hair effect measurement shows that receptivity decreased by 36%, which increased RTA time from 0 to 13 seconds, and attains lowest value. 8 times 10 to the power of minus 4 ohm cn, then it increased for the fuel increase in RTA time. This figure displays sharp absorption edge in the UV range. The average train distance for all samples is 91 to 94% in the visible region. The inset shows the absorption edge red chapter with RTA time. Optical band gap increased from 3.76 to 3.83 EV after RTA treatment for 30 seconds. The highest band gap is 3.83 EV at RTA 13 seconds. To evaluate the transparent conduction performance, the Huggins figure mirror was calculated and it enhanced by 91%. This result demonstrates that RTA treatment effectively improves the optometrical purpose of the FDO thin and the direct FDO thin are suitable for transparent electrode application. Thanks for your attention. The title of my presentation is Influence of Rapid Thermal Annealing Time and DNO as Thin Films Deposited by RF Metron Sputtering for Solar Cell Applications. I am Min Chen Wu. I come from National mm -hmm. Zhongxing University. Okay. Okay. So, uh, 
we have the last not last maybe we have extra one presentation the next presentation will be by ONC Lee on the improvements in the efficiency of p-type bifacial silicon solar cells with copper electrode using galvanic replacement reactions i don't know whether it's also from um, taiwan do not have uh, the video or the ppt with sound so i think yeah you told that that's all the you have one more presentation extra isn't it yeah but it is not least most of it yeah let me see if there is any sound here okay then so we have only nine participants who is the they are attending hello only. hello yeah no, yeah this is samita i think uh, my poster is last one Oh, you're the last one. Yeah. So you want to present yeah, live? Yeah, I want to present. Yeah, yeah, I think it's actually. Sure. OK, so can I share the screen? Yeah, please share the screen, okay. please. Thank Yeah, uh, so for giving me the opportunity to present my work here. So today I'll discuss uh, the study of part carrier dynamics of uh, CCS uh, in CCS CS4 CA SB2 CL12, which is also called CCSC in short. So we have synthesized these uh, microcrystals using a solution processed method, <laughs> and uh, uh, then we uh, obtain the powder XRD of the as uh, synthesized black powder. So from the powder XRD pattern, it is confirmed that uh, uh, it has C2 by M crystal structure. And the same image shows that these are irregular in shape and the ADX obtained from SEM confirms the expected elemental composition. So uh, we made the suspension of these CCSC in uh, toluene and chlorobenzene. And uh, this is the steady state absorption spectra of CCSC in toluene and chlorobenzene. So uh, from here we can see the it has broad absorption range ranges from near UV to near IR and with absorbance maxima around 590 nanometer and uh, the IR spectra of CCSC shows a strong peak around 6, 17 centimeter inwards uh, which confirms a metahalide stretching frequencies by the Raman bands uh, of this uh, CCSC. Uh, at 5, 156 to 80 and 560 centimeter inverse shows a stretching uh, uh, maybe due to the uh, different stretching and bending frequencies and the DLS spectra of uh, CCSC sus uh, suspension in chlorobenzene uh, shows that these, uh, the size is around 700 nanometer. And, uh, then to study the what carrier relaxation dynamics of CCSC in toluene and chlorobenzene? We have used a pumped spectroscopy. For doing so, uh, we have used a 400 nanometer pump to excite our sample and a white light probe. So, this is the contour plot and uh, spectral traces uh, for toluene and chlorobenzene. And uh, uh, from spectral traces, uh, we can see the, uh, we have obtained a ESA signal which is centered around 470 nanometer and a GS, broad GSB signal with a hump around 590 nanometer for both the cases, uh, toluene and chlorobenzene. And these are the uh, kinetic traces for uh, uh, ESA, for toluene and GSB. Uh, and these are the uh, kinetic traces for the uh, chlorobenzene, for the ESA and GSB. And uh, by fitting these kinetic traces using the Gaussian deconvolution equation, we obtain these time components. And the shortest time component of ESA correspond to uh, the hot electron uh, relaxation, and the shortest time component of uh, GSP correspond to the hot, hot hole relaxation. So from here, we, can, we have observed that the hot electron relaxation is faster than hot uh, elect, uh, hot than hot whole relaxation for CCSC <coughs> and the relaxation dynamics is faster in chlorobenzene. Thank you.
okay thank you very much for the presentation this presentation is not with me it is newly added so if you have possibility send me the presentation please so i'll archive every, everyone Okay, sir. Yeah. Okay, sir. Actually, I have already shared this, but I can share it once more. No you share from here in this chat box? No, 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 not from this chat box. Where it is here? And like from the portal. Mm -hmm. okay, okay. okay, thank you very much. If anybody has question on the last poster, maybe one question we can attend. Deeper uh -huh. Thanks, Professor Paul. And um, I guess this is the end of our conference. Yeah. And we would like to thank all the speakers and hope we can meet next year physically yeah. at UCLA because it's a, you know, it's a very special time here. Yeah, yeah. It's late. Okay, thank, thank you, you very so much, much for every presenters and my co-chairman, okay, <laughs> and Yung Ren. And thank you for your great help during the whole presentation. You helped me a lot. Thank you very much. Okay. See you later. See you. Next year. Thank you. Have much. a great day. Thanks. Good day. Bye. 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 Bye.